like to welcome everybody um, on this meeting on the future of machine learning and data intensive computing in the solid earth geosciences. Uh, we'd especially like to thank our sponsors, our invited speakers, and all those that traveled to get to this meeting, as well as the many people we expect to have uh, participate via telephone. Um, part of this committee's task is to provide advice on science, techno technical, and policy matters related to seismology, geodesy, geodynamics, and to review basic uh, and uh, applied research activities in the solid earth sciences that contribute to federal agency missions. Uh, and it's hard to think of a more timely topic than machine learning. Uh, obviously, the increasing power of computing systems combined with exponentially growing data holdings is leading to exciting new results and tremendous interest in the community. Uh, today, we want to explore where we are with machine learning as, as, and part of, as part of data intensive computing in general and think about and discuss where we as a geoscience community should be going next. We divided this day into four panels to, to focus discussion on particular aspects of uh, machine learning and data intensive computing as we go through the day. So on the first panel, we start with an overview of machine learning with uh, presentations by Dr. Carrie Ann Bergen, who's getting ready there, uh, an early career researcher at Harvard and lead author of an excellent review paper on this topic and that was in Science Magazine in March of this year. Then we look at work by two other early uh, career researchers in the field, Dr. Zachary Ross and Dr. Diego Melgar. Uh, and then after their presentations, we have 30 minutes for discussion uh, with the panelists as well as everyone in the room and on the phone. In the second panel, we tackle the challenging topic of next practical steps to accelerate and broaden the use of machine learning in geosciences with a remote presentation by Dr. Kinkai Kong of UC Berkeley. Uh, where we know there is not power, but we're hoping you will be able to connect. <laughs> uh, and he was also the lead author of another recent review paper that was in Seismological Research Letters uh, in January of this year. And then again, after that presentation, we'll have 30 minutes for discussions mm -hmm. on, on that topic. Uh, then we'll, at the end of the second panel, we'll take a one hour lunch break and we'll return with a third panel where we've invited two experts in machine learning from other related disciplines to present uh, on applications and advances mm -hmm. in their field. So first, uh, Dr. Hannah Kerner from the University of Maryland will present on machine learning applications of remote sensing. And then Dr. Brees Menard from John Hopkins University will present on uh, machine learning applications in physics and astrophysics. Uh, then we again have 30 minutes for general discussions. And then finally, in the fourth and last panel, we've invited Dr. Gregory Barroza of Stanford University, an expert with uh, long-standing experience and expertise in this area, uh, to review the current status of, of machine learning and data-intensive computing and help shape discussions on next steps to advance the science. So that's going to include both what we've learned in the first three panels as well as what's going on in the, in the field in general. And we hope to have a very stimulating discussion uh, in the 30 minutes after uh, Greg's presentation. As we stated in the introductory text, a goal of this meeting is to review both progress in machine learning and discuss what future investments are needed for a concerted long-term effort to organize geophysical data sets and combine them with appropriate data-intensive computing resources in the solid earth geosciences. That's the natural laboratory necessary for scientists across disciplines to most effectively work together. And we want to be able to discuss how those workflows and student training can be combined with approaches that provide insights into the physics of the Earth systems. So kind of the more ambitious goal is to look beyond what's needed to develop a deeper understanding besides using machine learning as a black box. Uh, and as uh, Kong et al. wrote in their overview paper, it would be transformative if we could develop a hybrid modeling framework that combines data-driven machine learning methods with explicit physical models. And I hope that we get into that in our discussion sections uh, coming up. So with that, I'm going to turn over the, uh, the gavel to uh, Dr. Cindy Eminger, committee member, who's going to lead the first panel. Well, uh, thank you for a great and comprehensive overview of the meeting. I just wanted to remind everyone in the room that we have a large number of people calling in or listening online, and so to try to use your microphones and, I mean, obviously the, oh, we'll be, the speakers themselves will be near a microphone the whole time as well. Um, what I, 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 it's my pleasure to introduce Kiran Bergen at, from Harvard University, who's going to be giving an overview, um, as 
of the the subject, but also to taking us inside the black box and that this whole first session as well. It will be motivating a discussion of where we stand, where there are potential gaps, and even um, thinking as well about the different funding agencies and the funding models, how uh, they support or uh, where there are cracks perhaps or gaps between the different funding agencies. They'll be pointing out some of these uh, topics for further discussion as the meeting evolves. So carry on. Thank you. Um, is this my, okay, it's working. Good. Um, can everyone hear me all right? All right. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks for the, the organizers for inviting me. So today I'm going to give sort of an, an overview of what I think is sort of the state of um, machine learning in the solid or geosciences. Um, and I just want to give sort of a, let's see, uh-oh. Okay. Sorry, we've been having some technical difficulties with the slides. Um, all right, so um, so I want to give sort of a, a little overview of kind of how um, how I got here and sort of what, where these um, sort of things that I'm sharing with you are going to come from. And so um, I'm by training, I'm, my background is in computational data sciences, um, but I've been working with seismologists for the last uh, five or so years. Um, I worked with Greg Barroza, who you're going to hear from later today on um, applying data mining methods for large-scale search to earthquake detection. And from working with seismologists from working on this project, um, one of the things that sort of came out of this collaboration was that um, I think both of us learned a lot about what are, what are some of the opportunities for machine learning um, in the solid earth geosciences, but also what are some of the things that, that it could be doing that it's not, um, things that people are um, that uh, there's a lot of really interesting work going on, but there's a lot of places where we could push further. Um, and there are certain obstacles to that. And so in order to sort of uh, share with people what we thought could help to advance this field uh, more, we wrote this review paper where we talked about what people are doing, highlighting some of the really interesting examples um, of work. And we also wanted to give some recommendations for what we, where we thought that the field needed to go in the future so that um, the solid earth geosciences could really innovate. Um, using machine learning in order to hopefully make more discoveries with um, the very large data sets that geoscientists have. Um, so just to start out, I want to give a brief sort of summary of what machine learning is. Um, so machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. Um, in traditional computing, what you would do is you would have some problem that you wanted to solve. So you'd take some data, you'd maybe have a model you wanted to run, so you'd write a set of commands, you'd write an explicit program for how you wanted the computer to process that data. Machine learning is a little bit different in that you want the, the computer to actually start to build the model itself from data. So it's learning from examples, which is how people use, or how people learn. But with data, with um, machine learning, computers can't actually have experiences. They can't experience things like people. So for a computer, learning from experience means learning from data. And so the idea of machine learning is you actually, rather than giving the computer a list of commands, you have it partially learn the model itself by looking at a lot of data. And so machine learning are tools for extracting patterns and building complex um, models from data. Um, a lot of these are predictive models, um, but there's a broad range of kinds of machine learning, which we'll highlight next. Um, and machine learning, it sounds really uh, sophisticated, really fancy, and some of the methods are, but also a lot of the methods are drawn from applied statistics. So methods like linear regression, logistic regression, and principal component analysis, which a lot of scientists use in their work regularly are actually pretty uh, are examples of pretty straightforward and simpler machine learning techniques. So a lot of the techniques that people are using now are sort of more sophisticated, complex versions of what scientists have already been doing for a long time. Um, and so this in this um, meeting, this also has the, the phrase data intensive computing in the title. And so I do want to say when, in this talk, when I talk about machine learning, I use it a little bit of a catch all. There are other techniques that the machine learning community wouldn't call strictly machine learning, but there are techniques for extracting information from data. Um, I usually call these sort of data mining techniques. And so I'm gonna, when I talk about machine learning, I'm really referring to both machine learning and these other data mining techniques that are designed to extract information from very large data sets. Um, so I've given you sort of an abstract definition. I wanna go a little bit more into um, what machine learning is and how it works. So a lot of the, um, Examples of machine learning that you hear about in sort of the news, a lot of the flashy applications are doing what's called supervised learning. And this is where you're actually building models from examples. Um, and what this looks like is rather than, as we say, we have a task where we want to build, um, have a computer distinguish cats from dogs. We want to build a classifier where it tells you whether something's a cat or a dog. 
a little bit of a silly task, but it has cute pictures. So, um, so what you could do is you could write a list of commands like, you know, look for pointy ears. Maybe that's a cat. You could list the set of rules, but this is a task that's hard to do to list out a set of commands to distinguish a cat from a dog. So instead, we can get a lot of labeled examples. Um, we can find pictures of cats and dogs on the internet. We tell the computer which ones are cats and which ones are dogs. We feed those into the machine learning algorithm, and it uses that data to come up with an with a optimal set of rules or criteria for distinguishing cats and dogs. And so the output of the machine learning algorithm is a prediction model. And this model, if we've done our job right, it should be able to take a new image and answer the question, is this new image a cat or a dog? Um, and hopefully it'll get the answer right um, if we've done a good job with machine learning. So this is supervised learning where you're actually giving the computer examples of the pattern that you want it to be able to reproduce and learn a model in order to do the same thing. Um, you can also do machine learning even when you don't have labeled data. And this is useful, especially in geosciences where we often have large unlabeled data sets. Um, and that's called unsupervised learning and a lot of data mining techniques would fall under this category as well. And this is using machine learning to find patterns in data. So if you have data, you don't have the labels, you may have a large collection, here's say images of different kinds of animals. You can feed these into a machine learning algorithm and depending on the choice of algorithms you uh, use, it's going to return some sort of structure in the data in a, if you're using an unsupervised learning algorithm. But what the structure might be, it could be uh, common patterns or features um, in your data or it might be groups of um, data points that are similar to each other. So it could give you re um, relationships between your data points or between the features of your data. So there's a lot of different kinds of structure and it'll, um, the, the kind of structure you find will depend on the algorithm. And so there are a lot of different kinds of machine learning algorithms out here. We talk about unsupervised and unsupervised learning. A little bit of a simplified picture. This is a little more complex simplified picture, but even then there's a lot of different kinds of machine learning algorithms. There are a lot of different ways that they can be used. Um, and up here we have um, deep learning, which is something you'll probably hear about more later today. Um, deep learning is just a, is, is a, is a type of machine learning. Um, it can be used for both supervised and, super, supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, but there's a lot more to machine learning than just deep learning. Deep learning are powerful tools, but there's a lot of different applications out there. Um, and so what I hope you guys take away from the meeting today is that machine learning can help geoscientists extract um, more knowledge and insights from larger data sets than ever before. So I really think machine learning is a very useful tool for processing large amounts of data. Um, and I say than ever before here, because geoscientists have been using machine learning for a long time. This isn't like an idea that we just discovered yesterday. Um, in the 90s, there were people who were using artificial neural networks, which is sort of a simplified version of the deep neural networks that are popular um, today. Uh, these methods were being used in the 90s for distinguishing earthquakes from explosions, for example. Um, in the 2000s, there was a lot of work with um, graphical models, like hidden Markov models, also for distinguishing, um, in this example, um, classifying uh, seismic signals. Um, and so these techniques are not necessarily new, but what's new is that there have been new developments um, coming from both the seismology side, um, the geoscience side, and from the um, computing technology side that have created new opportunities that hopefully geoscientists can leverage um, to make new discoveries. And so the first is that we have much larger data sets. So we have massive geoscience data sets. Large data sets for, in the context of machine learning, are both a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge is processing large data. means you have to have a lot of um, computing power. It can be challenging to work with. But the opportunity is if you're trying to find patterns in data, having a lot of data means you're going to be able to extract more signal. Um, and so we have a lot more data sets. Um, I've been working with seismologists, so those, when we talk about large data sets, we're often talking about in terms of the amount of time. We may have long records of data. There may be data from many instruments. Um, you'll hear later about remote sensing. There's large data sets from spatial temporal and remote sensing data sets. Um, there's also the outputs of large simulations, and I think people don't always think of these as data necessarily, but this is a, a, a kind of data are when you run a large-scale numerical simulation, you get a very large output back in some cases, and that's data that you can try to understand um, using machine learning techniques as well. And there's also people coming up with new um, sources of data, for instance, crowdsourced data, um, and so there's always new sensing modalities that are sort of coming online and creating new data sources. And so this is one area that's changed um, since the sort of early uses of neural networks and geosciences. We have a lot more data. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of new machine learning algorithms and models out there. There's been a lot of work over the last 10 years 
um, really pushing the state of the art in machine learning and sort of these big data technologies. Um, so I was working on this project fast where we were using uh, methods for sort of a big data type approach, um, the methods that um, are meant for large scale data. Um, there's also been a lot of work recently in deep learning and that's because the um, new network architectures like convolutional neural networks which can be trained and a huge number of other deep learning architectures that are designed um, to do a number of different kinds of tasks. Deep learning architectures um, that can work well, say for um, data on a grid, for sequences, that can learn to reconstruct. There's unsupervised type methods, generative models. There's a lot of different deep learning architectures out there now that give you a lot of flexibility in terms of the kinds of problems you can solve. Um, so this has really been a space where there's been a lot of work in the last 10 years, and that's why you're hearing about machine learning and AI everywhere. Um, and some of these new improvements in these models um, have really been enabled, and why you're hearing a lot about machine learning is because of improvements in computing um, technology and, and tools. So one of the reasons why deep learning really took off is the ability to actually move machine learning onto GPUs and be able to compute on large data sets, which was difficult previously to train the model. So there's been, um, now you can train it using GPUs. There's new techniques that allow you to do that as well in terms of the mathematical side. Um, there's also it's getting cheaper and easier to compute with big data. Um, there's a lot of it work, you know, you can now run all your machine learning models in the cloud, for instance. Um, and something that I think is really useful from the point of view of scientists are these open source machine learning frameworks. Um, a lot of them have been developed at companies that make these tools easier to use. And so it used to be that if you wanted to run a deep neural network, say 10 years ago, you would have to be, you know, a machine learning PhD student in one of the top labs. But now anyone can sort of pick these things up. You can do a tutorial, you can take a class online. Um, and it's easy for people to get started and actually run state-of-the-art models themselves. Um, so those are the, the things that I think have really made a difference in why machine learning sort of deserves a second look in um, solid geosciences and why this is, we're really seeing a lot of new developments in other scientific fields as well. Um, so machine learning has been particularly successful in a few different areas. Um, one of them has been in uh, computer vision or processing, natural, or processing images, um, for example, classifying images or segmenting them. Um, machine learning has also been really successful in natural language processing. So this is things like um, speech to text where you talk to your phone and it turns it into text and then um, when you talk to Siri or Alexa, all these sort of things. Um, and the combination of the two, so now you can do things like that combines both image processing and natural language, which is image captioning. So these kinds of applications with images and natural language have become quite sophisticated to the point that these are actually like products that companies can sell to people. Um, they're in a pretty advanced stage. Um, there's also been a lot of developments that have gotten a lot of interest in gameplay. Um, for instance, the AlphaGo thing was, was highly popularized. Um, but other things like robot soccer and these kind of fun things that, that um, a lot of machine learning people like to work on. So these are some areas where machine learning has been really successful. But some of the things these applications have in common um, is that one is that these are data that tend to be on structured grids, so images and um, sequential data like language. Those are very structured data sets. Um, the tasks that, is, that we talk about, that I talked about here, are pretty well defined, and these are tasks that are also um, easy for humans to perform, which means you can create large volumes of high quality labeled data for these kind of tasks. It's easy for a human to label an image and tell you if it's a cat or a dog, so you can get a very large number of cat and dog images, for instance. Um, and so this contrasts a little bit in terms of what we see in um, the sciences. So data sets in uh, solid or geoscience are a little bit harder to work with sometimes, um, as many of you here know. Um, so sometimes the signals that we're interested um, in have a low signal to noise, so we may have um, a harder time picking up the signals we're interested in. The data also tend to be very noisy. Um, these are real data sets, not sort of nicely cleaned and curated data sets that a lot of people are using um, in their sort of test problems. Um, there's also the problem of that we often don't have labels for the data, so a lot of times we have sensor data, put out sensors, you collect data, but you don't actually have labels for what's in this in this data. Um, and if you can get labels, they may not be as high quality as you need. Um, you may not be able to get as many as you need, or they may not be exactly, um, they may not be perfect in every case. Um, it can be harder to, to obtain. And part of that is because the ground truth is, is unavailable. So we may know, um, we may know some things that are in our data set, but we can't actually say for sure that we found everything. Um, and so not knowing kind of the right answer can be, make it challenging to apply machine learning in, in some tasks. Um, because we have such large data sets, we need methods of scale. Um, so that's another challenge. But, we need, but one of the scaling challenges that's sort of particular 
to scientific data sets is that you often need data sets that are large because you're looking at phenomena that um, act across multiple scales. So in, in seismology, when we think about, um, for instance, earthquakes, earthquakes happen over a very short period of time, but sort of the, the um, scale between, for instance, the time between earthquakes can be very large, um, or the processes that are driving earthquakes, like um, sort of tectonics, that happens over a much larger time scale. So you have to sort of think about um, modeling across scales, both in terms of time and in space. Um, you can have things that are on sort of the poor scale, but you also can have things on, on sort of the global scale um, and the, how those interact can be important to model in some cases. Um, so there's a number of different challenges. So the question here is how, do, how is machine learning actually being used in, in solid or geoscience today? Um, and how might it be used in the future? And so when we were thinking about writing our review papers or summarizing where things are, uh, we came up with this um, sort of three different modes of machine learning. Um, and these are automation, modeling, and discovery. And these aren't meant to be distinct. Um, they overlap. Um, but I think it's a useful way to think about the kinds of tasks that you can use machine learning for in sciences. So the first um, is automation or automated prediction, um, decision making, or data analysis. Um, and the goal in when we're doing automated prediction or these kind of tasks are tasks where we want to perform some sort of co complex or repetitive task that could be challenging for a human to perform. Um, it might be something that would be not challenging for a human to perform, but might be tedious. Um, or it could something that would, or it could be a task that might be infeasible to have a human perform because of the size of your data sets. You may have to have a human. This would be something like, for instance, a spam filter. Like a human could tell you easily if an email is spam, but it would be tedious and infeasible to have someone sitting there pre-filtering your emails for you, right? So these are the kind of tasks where you want to automate things. Um, it also could be a task where, um, where you know how people know how to do it, but it's difficult to actually express this as a set of explicit commands. So this is again, for instance, our example with cats and dogs, humans know what, the, what a cat and a dog looks like, but actually trying to write out a program that will do that is a challenging task because we don't quite know how people do it. So these are the kind of tasks that we may want to think about um, automating with machine learning. Um, and so this, in these cases, machine learning, the focus is often using machine learning as a tool for high accuracy predictions. Um, and here I use prediction in the sense of um, sort of labeling the, the data, um, not necessarily predicting the future. Um. <laughs> All right, so this is, this is the idea here, but one of the things that I think this is an area where a lot of the current use of machine learning in geoscience has been to date. Um, and in part that's because this is often sort of the, the low hanging fruit of machine learning in, um, in the sciences, because often what you're doing is you're taking a process that you're already doing, you either have a process that's automated in some way and you wanna improve the accuracy of that process, or you have a process that you've hired a grad student to do repetitively and you wanna automate that. Um, and so these are, this is an area where we've seen a lot of work because it's sort of, these are kind of, in some ways, it is a low hanging fruit, the obvious things to automate with machine learning. All right, so what are some examples of this? So these are examples, these are not my own work, so um, I'll do my best to represent what they're doing. Um, but th so some of these examples are from automated data analysis in this case. So one of them is classifying volcanic ash particles. So this is a task where they have these, um, these images, they're particles of volcanic ash, and they want to know just which shape category they fall into, right? And this is something you could hire a grad student to do. Um, they probably wouldn't enjoy it very much, but that's, you know, what grad students have to do sometimes. So this is a task that's very tedious for an analyst. Um, but because these are just look like, these are nice data on a grid, these look like images, this is something that we expect that machine learning could do pretty well, right? Because machine learning is good at image processing, so being able to tell you which shape these are, um, a human could do it, but a machine could be trained to do this fairly um, easily. And so this is a task that's well suited to automation with machine learning. Um, another example where there have been a lot of papers has been in um, seismic signal analysis, like examples like phase picking of seismic data. Um, these are processes that may already be semi-automated or um, automated. And the idea of using machine learning here is you may want to improve the accuracy of the automated process or fully automate it. So a lot of times there's kind of a human in the loop um, tweaking the results, and we may want to fully automate this and improve the accuracy over the existing pipeline. So this is an area where machine learning can be used. Even if it's already automated, machine learning may be able to do better than um, our previous attempts, which may have been trying to write out a series of explicit commands of how we think people would do the task. Um, um, it can also be for automated prediction. Um, an example of this is lithological mapping. So here would be, um, they take geophysical and remote sensing data, um, and they try to be able to map that to a lithology using data that are just sparse examples. So they can't actually go and take measurements, determine the lithology of every single spot on this grid, 
Um, and so using the few measurements, the few ground truth examples that you have, um, or the few observations that you have, um, you can then fill in the rest of the map is the idea here. And so this is something where um, we're able to, this is something where it would be hard for a person to do this manually, it would be a lot of work. And so this is something that, that sort of lends itself to automation with machine learning. Um, so there are some challenges that come up when we think about applying uh, machine learning in this sort of automation context in the solid earth geosciences. Um, one is something called data center covariate shift, which is when the data that you're using to train your model um, doesn't always match the data that you want to test it on. Um, so this can happen in a lot of cases. Maybe the data that you have for training is data from simulations, but you want to apply it to real world data. So these kind of things can, can come up. Also, if your data somehow changes over time, um, that may create these, these kind of issues with automation. Um, or the challenges, um, the thing about when I say these challenges though, I think about them in an in a optimistic way and that they're challenges, but these are also kind of the hooks for the data science community. These are where, areas where we need their help and collab can collaborate with them. Um, there's also issues with biases in the data collection labeling. It's easy, um, there's some data that are easier to label than others, but those are often not the data we're interested in, right? You can easily label the frequent events, the large events, um, but the smaller, more um, infrequent, or sort of difficult to, um, phenomena that are more difficult to pull out of your data, those are the ones you're interested in. So you may have these biases in your data set that they're, they over-represent the kind of events that are not as interesting to you. Um, and evaluating performance can be challenging because we don't have high quality ground truth um, in some cases. And so it can be difficult to sort of automate and iterate on um, your process of developing machine learning solutions when you don't actually know the right answer. Um, so that's, that's sort of the overview of automation. There's been a lot of work there. There's been a little bit less work in this area of modeling and inversion, but I think that this is an area that's really interesting and will sort of be um, where I hope we'll see a lot of work um, in the near future. Um, and so the idea in modeling and inversion, um, I focus on modeling, I say inversion because this can be a forward or um, inverse model, is we really want to use machine learning as a tool um, to build models. And so we want to create a representation that captures relationship or structure in the data. And I mean this sort of broadly. So one of the things you can do with modeling is to learn a surrogate model. So say you have some large simulation that you do, and you just use this large simulation to get an estimate of like one value, right? So you do a lot of computing to just get one, one value. And maybe you don't care about it being 100% accurate. It has to be good enough, right? It might be a subroutine in another, um, and some other code that you're running. And so we, what one way you could use machine learning is to actually automate that process to, you, to um, or sorry, to build a model that will predict what those values are, to learn a surrogate model that approximates your more complex model and gives you an, a rough answer that requires less computation. Um, another area is for model reduction and coarse graining. This is something that a lot of other sciences have been used, uh, uh, um, an area in which a lot of other sciences have been using machine learning, and that's to take your full system and learn a reduced representation of that system, something that's simpler to model, that has the same properties as the ones that you're interested in. Um, and so this is something you see a lot in, for instance, um, computational chemistry, material scientists do a lot of that. Um, and so a lot of the modeling applications that I think are of interest are places where we see machine learning sort of intersecting with sort of the traditional computational sciences and numerical simulations. Um, and so I'll give you a couple examples of this. Um, so one is this um, work where they're using machine learning to simulate wave fields. So the idea here is if you have a 1D velocity model, you, can ha you have a forward model um, that can actually just directly compute your wave fields at a given time. So you have to do this using finite difference modeling and you have to take a number of time steps and all of a sudden it can take a lot of time to compute this. Um, and so what they did here was they took and they ran their, took their velocity models, they ran these simulations. Um, but the, the challenge here is if you wanted to use a new velocity model, you have to sort of start from scratch and you have to run it all over again, even if you just change the velocity model a little bit. Um, and so what they did was they took examples where they had a velocity model, they ran their simulations, and they used those as training data. So they wanted to use the velocity model as sort of their input, this is the, the image of the cat or the dog, and then the label is actually the output of the simulation. Um, in this case. And so they want to, the reason that they do this is because the prediction model will now allow them to take a new velocity model and actually then predict what the wave fields are without having to completely recompute it. Um, and so this is giving you, this is a case where you're getting sort of a faster uh, model um, than having to actually run your full sort of numerical calculations every time. Um, another example of this is, uh, of modeling is using model reduction and this is um, 
for flow in porous media. So here they have discrete fracture networks um, that are used to model um, flow and transport. And so if you have the full network model, um, it can be more uh, computationally intensive to compute on those. So the goal is to find these sub-networks, which they call, in this case, they use the term backbone um, for this reduced network model that has the sort of same, or that, that captures the bulk of the flow, that they can just model this sub-network um, in their computational simulations, um, and it will sort of give them the same results. So, and so this reduced model can be difficult to find, and so what they do here is they actually use machine learning to pick out what that sub-network is. Um, they take their full network and they use a machine learning model to predict which of the fractures in this network, which pieces of it should be included in the sub-network so that they can have this reduced model. Now they can do their computations on this model. Um, and this is something that they could do before where they, um, they could actually compute what the sub-network was, but that was a computationally intensive process. So machine learning allows them to do this in a more efficient way. Um, and this is a, so this is a tool to really speed up um, the calculations that they're doing. All right, um, so the challenges that, that come along with this sort of, in this sort of modeling um, mode of machine learning, one is quantifying model uncertainty um, with traditional sort of computational techniques, um, numerical methods. You often have a good idea of what your uncertainty is. Um, that's something that applied mathematicians um, study and model, and that can be more difficult to determine from machine learning systems. Um, there may be physical constraints or domain knowledge that you want to incorporate into your modeling. Um, and so that's a little bit more tricky to do because most of these methods are designed to be fully data driven. So um, it requires more work to actually embed this sort of information into your, um, into your machine learning architecture and into your solution. Um, and there's also, with, when you're, if you're using simulations um, and the outputs of simulations is your training data, there may be an expense of actually being able to collect the data in order to do machine learning. So we say, well, we can use machine learning to speed up simulations, but if you want to train it, you have to run a bunch of simulations first. And so that's, um, one of the sort of downsides of this approach. It works well if you already have a lot of existing um, calculations that you've done. Um, and so the last example or the last um, mode of machine learning that I want to talk about is um, discovery or discovering patterns and insights from your data. Um, and so the idea here is that you want to extract new information. Um, that information might be pattern, structure, relationships um, in your data set. Um, and what's key here is that you want to find patterns that are not easily revealed by conventional analysis techniques. The idea is to use machine learning to get a different view of your data that you aren't able to get um, from the techniques that you have right now. Um, and so some of the techniques that I think are really useful in discovery, um, and there's going to be, I think, the machine learning community is also really interested in these kind of techniques going forward, are unsupervised learning techniques and generative models um, for exploring large unlabeled data sets. Because um, a lot of the techniques out there now these you know, convolutional neural networks, image processing, they work really well for labeled data sets. Um, but where we, what we need for discovery is we need to be able to work with unlabeled data. Um, and so that's a key aspect, I think, of, of discovery and where there's a lot of opportunity for growth is in this area. Um, and I'll just give one example um, of this where in, this is in uh, geosciences, um, which is finding uh, patterns among seismic signals. So this is work out of Columbia where they took, um, this is 46,000 earthquakes from the um, Geyser's geothermal field, and they use machine learning to essentially tease out what are the differences between these different signals and the relationships between them. Um, and they used um, a couple of different machine learning techniques. They used representation learning and clustering, um, and they were able to identify um, sector temporal patterns um, that were too subtle for traditional methods to find. So these were patterns that they wouldn't have been able to find from traditional methods, and it gave them um, insights that they wouldn't have been able to find otherwise. And so this is a kind of area where I think there's a lot of uh, potential. There's also a lot of interesting applications that are, I would group under discovery, coming from other fields. Um, and so I just want to highlight one that I think is of particular interest to um, in the solid earth community, um, which is learning to learning governing equations from data. Um, so this is a lot of, there's a lot of groups in the applied mathematics community who are working on this. Um, this is work out of the University of Washington, where they are basically trying to take snapshots of some system, and they want to use machine learning to actually determine what those governing equations are that was, um, and what the physics were that was um, controlling that system. Um, and so that's something that I think, these are the kinds of things that I think moving forward, um, we, I would like to see more of in the geoscience community. 
Um, and so with, with discovery, there's some challenges. One is that because we're interested in outliers, infrequent events, um, or unexpected patterns, it can be hard to use machine learning because machine learning is really looking at, um, it's really good at finding these kind of common patterns in the data, kind of the overall trends, but it can be difficult to find, you know, what, what are these kind of more unusual cases? Like how do you train a machine learning algorithm to find something that's surprising or unexpected? Um, that's a much more challenging task than cats and dogs. Um, and part of that is because machine learning algorithms are really good at interpolating between data. Um, but they're not as good as ex at extrapolating. And so in some cases, when you're trying to discover, you're trying to look outside of what you um, what you already know, and that's getting into the realm of extrapolation. Um, the other challenge is that often discovery requires us not just to have a, we might be able to build a machine learning model that does some task really well, makes a prediction, but we want to understand why. What was it doing, and how was it, how did it learn, what did it learn in order to, um, to do that? And these models can be difficult to interpret. So a lot of times, the, the discovery piece will require interpreting what's going on in the model. Um, and that's an area that still needs a lot of work. Um, and so sort of in reflecting on all this in our review paper, we, we talk about um, different ways to advance um, the sort of state of machine learning research in solid or geosciences. So one of these is um, open science techniques, like having open access papers, using electronic preprints, um, having codes be open source. Um, and this is for two reasons. One is that sharing um, Sharing research, sharing code, sharing data makes research move faster. This is something that the computer science community has adopted, and it's one of the reasons why they move so quickly. It also makes it easier to collaborate with computer scientists because this is already a part of their culture of how their sort of academic field and publishing works. Um, and so it puts them more in line, makes it easier to collaborate with them because you don't have these fights over can we put our paper up on a preprint server and these, these kinds of issues? Can we share a code? Um, another is benchmark data sets. Um, so this is um, a challenge because we often, when it comes to ground truth, we don't always know um, what the correct answer is. And that means that you may have a bunch of people creating algorithms. They'll make up their own ground truth, and then you don't know who did the best job because everyone's kind of scoring themselves based on their own criteria. It makes it really difficult to improve upon what people have done because you don't really know who's actually doing a better job at a particular task. So by having sort of clear benchmarks, sharing our data, sharing our code, um, we can actually advance the field rather than everyone kind of writing independent papers that we don't know what to make of as a, as a community. Um, now there is a geo, geo data science education, so things like um, more education of these kind of techniques in the geoscience community um, and both for the geoscience community to itself to develop these solutions, but also to make it easier to collaborate with people in the machine learning and data science community. Um, and the other is, I think there are a lot of opportunities given all these sort of challenges that I talked about for new research on the data science side. Um, and I say that as someone who's coming from a data science background, and part of what interests me about geoscience is that there are a lot of um, interesting and challenging data problems here. And so I think um, part of this geoscience, um, the data science education in geosciences will also help to better communicate and actually get assistance from people in the data science community like to facilitate those collaborations so we can actually develop new solutions that are specific to the needs of um, data science or of geoscientists um, in collaboration with data scientists. And some things that like um, interpretable methods is one area um, that we highlight and also methods that incorporate physics and domain knowledge, combining physical models and data driven models. Um, and so that's um, where I conclude, and so thank you, everyone. Um, right. Thank you, thank you so much, Carrie Ann, for for so uh, clearly articulating the scope of the meeting and presenting such an excellent structure for further discussions. Two things: um, we have time for just a couple of quick questions. I um, remind everyone that we have 30 minutes of discussion at the end of this session. And so I'd like you to um, ask only specific questions um, to carry on right now and leave, leave uh, commentary about where the, for example, more general questions like where is the join between geoscientific research and data sciences research or, you know, some of the open source and open access um, discussions to, to this later part of the talk. I also remind everyone to please um, use a microphone or get your hand up so we can get you a microphone so that you, we, um, those on, uh, listening online can hear the entire discussion. So uh, do we have a brief question? Um, so Tor and then Jeff, and then we'll move on. Uh, Great talk, Carrie. And I was wondering if you could 
explain a little bit more how those ODE guessing machine learning things work? The example of the reaction diffusion system where the machine learning came up with the ODE. Uh, yeah, so that's not my work, so I'll do my best. Um, I can refer you to the paper. Um, so that's what, that's work where um, one of the things that they're doing is they're, my understanding of, of the paper, um, is that they're trying to essentially learn the model by enforcing a constraint of sparsity. So they want to learn a model that's sparse, and they design their network so that each of the terms in the model corresponds to some sort of term in the physics equation. So they use a machine learning model that learns to reconstruct the data, but it forces it to sort of pass through this layer that has some sort of sparse kind of physics model. Um, and by enforcing that sparsity constraint, they get back, because most physics models are somewhat, or a lot of the governing equations are, are sparse. In the sense that there's usually not like a million terms in your physics equation. Um, there's usually just a, a couple. And so by enforcing that sparsity and sort of running the reconstruction of the data through um, a model that's looking at the physics, they're able to actually then pull out what are those coefficients, which ones were non-zero, and then map that back to the, the equations. Um, if that makes sense. And so the input is sort of a, a time series of realizations of the system. Yeah. And then yeah, it so kind of does a temporal snapshot. interpolation, which comes out to be the ODE. Yeah, so they're using the time snapshots. And then they also, I think they directly compute the, the derivatives from that. And they're, in this particular example, there's other, there's other um, groups that are doing similar thing. And so they may do it in a different way. Um, but I, my understanding is that they're using, that they're trying to learn to, um, the model is essentially like a, a the, the objective of the model is to learn how to reconstruct the data. Um, but it has this, if I, well, I don't think I can go back to the slide, but um, anyway, but it shows the, the, there's sort of these two networks and then there's kind of this skinny piece in the middle and that's basically forcing the reconstruction through a sparse kind of physics model. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay. And Jeff? Yeah, I wonder um, if you're looking at sort of the discovery mode, mm -hmm. um, let's suppose that you devise or a black box that finds a pattern mm -hmm. in the data that you didn't realize was there. What could you give a concrete example? What would you then do to actually try to figure out what's causing the, the pattern? Essentially, it has identified something that's there. How, how would you go about trying to tease out what the what's actually going on inside? Do you... Yeah, so that's sort of an open an open challenge. I have been reading about that. So I have like I can sort of give you some examples. So one of the things that sometimes people try to do is there are models that are easier to interpret, like linear regression is fairly easy to interpret. You just have a few coefficients. You can sort of tell yourself a story about what's going on with that. Um, so what some people will do is they'll try to take the model that they've learned and they'll try to either learn a global or a local linear model that um, that models either tries to approximate the solution or maybe just locally, and then they try to interpret those coefficients. So that's one way. Um, some of these neural networks, there's other, these other techniques that try to like visualize what do you, there's all these different sort of features that are being learned. Um, deep neural networks work well because, um, and I took out this slide, maybe I should have kept it, but um, it, the, one of the reasons that deep learning methods work really well is the same thing that makes them hard to interpret, which is that they're learning both the, the um, prediction task or the classification task, but then they're, at the same time, they're learning what features to use for that task. And so it can be difficult to understand what are these features it's, it's teasing out. And so there are people who have developed techniques to try to poke at the method, the network and kind of try to figure out what is, what are these features, what kind of things um, excite them or activate the different parts of the network. Um, and those techniques are sort of controversy over the, what, how much it's actually telling you how, how useful those kind of techniques are. Um, but you can get some information out of them in some cases. Um, for instance, there was this, I don't know, it was this Google Deep Dream where they were taking all these images and making them look like they had all these strange things like hidden in the background. Um, if you Google Deep Dream, you'll find like a blog post that has all these crazy images. And these are the kind of techniques where they're trying to, to actually tease out what's going on in the network. And so a lot of these techniques work well for tasks that humans are good at. So for images, like if you can try to... Um, I, I guess I should, when I talked about unsupervised learning, I had these two examples of grouping images and these features, and there was this kind of cat face. That was something that came out from a neural network, and that, that was sort of interpretable. A person could look at that and say, I think that's a cat. Um, but you may get those kind of results um, for images. You may be able to interpret them a little bit. Uh, but in some cases, it, it can be hard with scientific data um, because it, it is harder for humans to interpret. So a lot of the techniques, I think, that people are developing for interpreting, say, image classifiers and understanding what's going on within them don't always translate. Um, so that is an area of active research. People are really interested in can we understand what they're doing, but it is hard to do because the models are really complex. But 
Um, trying to make these like linear approximations is one that I think is a little bit more successful. Um, but it's always a question of how much is that actually telling you. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Carrie Ann. And now we'll move on. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Zach Ross from Caltech. And yeah. So could you just tap the mic and be sure it's on? Zach, can you? No, it's on? Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, so earthquakes have this really funny property where uh, the smaller that they are, the more of them that you get. Um, and I think, you know, a snapshot of data like this really illustrates this clearly where, you know, this is 15 minutes by basically 24 hours right during uh, the heart of the, the recent Ridgecrest earthquake sequence. And the main shock here is 7.1 is this a uh, big red waveform there. And so you can see all of this stuff going on, all these different scales. Of course, the more that you zoom in here, the more that you're able to see. And this continues all the way down to the background level where um, we're able to pick up, you know, vehicles nearby, air traffic, remote earthquakes and things like that. Um, and so, you know, key goal in seismology is to recover as many of these, these events as possible so we can build catalogs of them. Um, but typical techniques for doing so really um, they, they fall short of, of, of recovering most of what we're actually recording in the data. And so in particular, these kind of hidden events that are there are really important because they fill in the gaps between uh, all the larger ones and they tell a much more complete story about how these sequences are evolving in space and time. Um, but they also represent the vast majority of the data that we have. And so being able to uh, identify all this stuff helps us move everything uh, quite a bit forward. Um, so, okay, so this is a map of uh, Southern California here. So, um, hard, a, little, a little hard to see here, but every dot is basically an earthquake. Um, San Andreas Fault is here. We can look at the magnitudes associated with these, and we can count them. Here's a histogram. And if you look at the envelope of this, you can see that it basically has linear scaling down to about magnitude one and a half or, one and a half or so, which tells us that because we believe this keeps going forever, <laughs> Uh, that we're starting to miss events below about one and a half. And so if we were able to push this down to, let's say, a full magnitude unit smaller, we expect because of uh, a B value of basically one that we would find something like 10 times more events here, which means that we'd have a lot more information available to us to use. Okay, so, um, so how do we even traditionally detect earthquakes in the first place? Um, for decades, this has been dominated by the use of moving averages. And so um, this kind of underlies almost all of the real-time seismic operations worldwide. So you have some seismic data like this, and you basically run a couple of moving averages on this, one that's really short, and it's designed to track uh, basically the running signal level across the data set, and then a longer one that is designed to track the running noise level. And if you take the ratio of these two, you get something that looks like this, which basically is supposed to increase when you get some kind of impulsive transient signal there, and then decrease otherwise. And you can set some threshold here and above which you would then trigger and you'd say that you've detected something. At this point, you don't know if this is an earthquake or not. It's something that might be an earthquake and, and needs to be subjected to additional tests and so forth. But this is really kind of a key algorithm behind all of earthquake monitoring uh, even today. Um, so how do we go about building a catalog? Well, we take data like this. And so this is potentially streaming in in real time every second. We're getting packets of this data flowing in. And so we run these kind of moving average detectors across this whole thing. And these are making tentative phase picks continuously at all the different stations that we have in the network. And at the same time, we have an algorithm that we call an associator, which is basically some kind of decision module that's looking at combinations of all of these picks across the network and seeing if there's some subset of them that basically back projects to a coherent origin somewhere within the network. And if there is, we basically take all of those that back project there, convert them into essentially phase arrivals, and we say that the event is formally detected at that point in time. And so um, once we do this, we can then locate the event using those picks. Um, we can then go on to calculate magnitudes. We can derive earthquake source properties and everything else that starts to go on from here. Um, and so this is important because 
um, basically this catalog, so everything leading up to this point here, is kind of the starting point for almost all downstream analyses that we do in seismology, which means if you're talking about your seismic tomography studies or your tectonic analyses or your analyses of earthquake source property, all that stuff heavily depends on having this catalog here and the measurements that are contained within it. So, um, so that's, you'd say, well, okay, we have this great workflow here and we're running this in real time. It must be pretty useful. Um, in reality, setting up something like this is incredibly difficult to do. Um, it takes lots of people to precisely calibrate all these algorithms for a specific data set. And in reality, seismologists all the time deploy instrumentation to record new data, new places where we've never seen anything before. We don't know where the earthquakes are coming from. And setting up something like this is a very non-trivial exercise. Um, so we really lack the capabilities for extracting um, information easily from these large data sets. But we would also like to move beyond kind of these old school algorithms that are based on moving averages and things that don't know what earthquakes look like to really improve on all this. So um, today I'm going to talk a lot about how to do this with deep neural nets. I'm going to focus particularly on these parts here, uh, these face picking algorithms and the association step. But I'm also going to talk about a few other um, areas where this whole thing can improve. And so again, Improvements here um, and it kind of streamlining this process, gaining more sensitivity, have the ability to impact everything that kind of um, comes downstream. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk a lot about convolutional networks in, in, in here today. Um, and so I want to highlight particular aspects about convolutional networks that make them very well suited for seismological purposes. Um, so convolutional networks are systems that um, allow you to basically input some kind of raw data like this. So in our case, it's going to be a waveform and output some set of predictions. So in this, it might be, you know, likelihood of a, of a seismic wave or a different type of seismic wave, for example. Um, and they have some kind of nonlinear mapping in between. And in particular, uh, we have this feature extraction system here um, combined with something, basically a fully connected neural net here. So, um, this feature extraction system is kind of the heart of this convolutional network, and it's designed to basically account for translation invariant structure that we expect to exist in the data. Um, and that's because seismograms, we expect there to be translation invariants. If you just cut some window, you expect that the arrival could be anywhere within the window, and you need to be able to extract that information automatically. So um, this type of structure is very well suited for time series seismic data. Um, we can basically say that this system here functions because you basically have a stack of filters that are very short and the value of these filters um, are learnable. And so one at a time you take these filters and you convolve them with um, basically the output or, or, or the input here and you pass it through some kind of activation function which produces basically a heat map that activates when, it find, when the filters find something that they're looking for. And so um, from here you can basically downsample um, these activations and repeat this whole process by convolving again with the outputs from that previous layer. So you're finding again stuff that you're looking for, but now at a different scale. And you again pass it through an activation function and you repeat this whole process a bunch of different times. And the idea is that by the time you finish this whole thing, uh, you've been able to extract patterns from the data in a translation invariant manner. And so from here, you can take these features you can pass it into your standard neural net and use that to do some kind of class prediction about the things that you care about. So um, that's basically what makes convolutional networks state of the art for all sorts of types of problems where the data has a translation variant structure. Um, and so they are excellent at this task because they're able to generalize the knowledge contained in extremely large data sets, which means that you don't need to have some kind of specific match to things that you've seen before in the past. Um, now, the major limitation of all this is that they require large amounts of labeled data. And that means, as, as Carrie Ann talked about before, you have some kind of ground truth examples of that phenomenon. So um, in seismology, uh, it turns out that, that we are quite rich in, in labeled data. Um, we've been labeling earthquakes and phases for more than a century at this point. Um, an example of a data set like this is what we hold at Caltech, which is basically labeled phase data back to 1932. And so 
you know, this is associated now with millions of earthquakes, um, more than tens of millions of, of hand-measured PNS wave arrival times. Um, we also record and save all these first motion polarities, which we can use to calculate earthquake focal mechanisms. And so, um, so for the first part of this, I mean, the goal is basically to use these large label data sets to train deep neural nets to do earthquake detection very well. Okay. So, um, so how might this work? So here's a, a snapshot of data, three components, N, E, and Z. Um, and so given this, which might have a couple of earthquakes in it, so here's four events. The red is for P waves and blue is for S waves. And they all have the same S minus P time here, as you can see. Um, and what we would like to do is, given this time series, we would like to output um, basically a probability time series uh, of equivalent length, where actually it's, it's a couple of them. So for this case, you have one for P waves and one for S waves. You can also add one for noise, for example. And in this case, you would want it so that all of these sum to one at any given time step and can be interpreted naturally as probability. So in this scenario here, whenever you have a seismic wave present, you'd like this to go from something near zero to one and then back down again and so forth. So that you can then set some kind of simple trigger threshold uh, and just read that off to detect and log your seismic wave detection. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you could go about getting this. You could take it in a model like I showed you before where it outputs three numbers and for a single window of data, you can assign those to the center time point of the window and then slide that along and generate a time series like that. You could also do a multi-target uh, prediction problem where you given this time series, you could output the whole time series and that's been done successfully. So there's a lot of different strategies that you can use here to achieve this and it's not really limited to any one um, particular uh, architecture. Uh, so basically, um, so I'll talk about one particular example of this here. Um, so we took this big data set that I've curated. It's basically almost 300,000 earthquakes, uh, 700 something stations, and it's about four and a half million seismograms split evenly between P waves, S waves, and what I'll just call pre-event noise seismograms. And so given this whole data set, and so these are kind of some random draws from that, P waves, S waves, and noise, um, we can have a model that just looks at these and learns how to classify them just based on the, the raw time series alone. So we can take this whole data set, we can train this model end to end to minimize the prediction error directly on the ground truth by making adjustments to these filter parameters uh, accordingly. So, um, so I'll, I'll show some examples about how this might work. Uh, so this is a swarm that occurred down near the southern end of the San Andreas here a couple of years ago, uh, this near Bombay Beach, California. So these kind of circles here were events part of that swarm and I'll apply it to some continuous data that was recorded during that time. So, um, so here's a chunk of data that's 10 minutes long. Um, if we do this in a sliding window mode where for each window you just classify it and assign that to the center time point, you can generate a probability time series just like this and trigger every time you exceed some threshold here where these colors indicate different types of seismic waves that were detected. We're going to zoom on this and um, you can see kind of examples of the temporal sensitivity that comes out of this. So here you have data that's two minutes long or so, and there are about 14 events uh, in this time series. So we're able to resolve events basically that are only a few seconds apart for both phases as a very quick um, turnaround between them. So even when they're close to overlapping, we can still resolve them. And that's really not a capability that we had with these moving average type of techniques. Uh, we can take this, we can run on even longer data. So here's 24 hours. Uh, we can look at it relative to the onset of the swarm here and track how the number of detections increases over time. So we can see the swarm starts exactly right here. And then these two types of seismic wave detections just rise together, leading to something like eight times as many phases that you detect over this 12 hour period. So, um, and this is relative to the, the original regional network catalog that we were we were comparing it to. So there's a lot more increased sensitivity when applying a technique like this. Um, and it's really quite powerful. Um, so there's lots of other really exciting applications of, of deep learning to earthquake detection related processes. One of them is in the area of signal denoising. Um, so this work by, by Zhu et al, which comes out of the Stanford group, um, basically takes some kind of input noisy seismogram like this 
and has a model that, given some ground truth, learns how to denoise this into this. So you can split this into a clean seismogram that's noise free and to clean noise, whatever that really means. Um, and in between, you have a model that basically learns some kind of low dimensional representation of this input and then uses that low dimensional representation to reconstruct um, these clean uh, signal examples. And so this is one, I think, really exciting future direction uh, for applying neural nets to seismology. Uh, what, this is going to help us detect uh, seismic waves better, also measure their times better, other signal properties, things like that. And obviously, there's going to be a lot more work to come, I think, in this area in the future. Um, there's also very exciting applications to phase arrival picking. So um, you can take a model and you can train it to, for example, predict the time that of the onset of a, of a seismic wave within a given window. Um, and here, for example, we took basically a million phase picks um, and compared the predictions doing this against the ground truth. And 75% of them are within basically three samples of what the human being could do. And if you put 100 people in a room and had them measure the onsets of, of these seismic waves, that would be basically about the error of what a human could do. So we're basically within this, or potentially even better, um, and really if you know about the history of all this stuff, seismologists have been developing automated algorithms that have been chasing the performance of what humans could do for basically 40 years at this point. And all these algorithms, even up until maybe two years ago, were still far behind um, what a human could do. And so now, really with deep learning, this has kind of just changed dramatically. Um, and of course, this propagates into everything that, that goes downstream. Um, there's other architectures you could use to do basically the same thing. So this is with PhaseNet, um, which is basically using a, a, a unit type architecture to predict the entire time series uh, for given an input waveform. And so you can do P waves and S waves here and then compare them against um, you know, an autoregressive type picker here, you can see clear, clearly that the, the uncertainties shrink significantly. Um, and I think this is going to keep going better and better. So um, this has very fundamental implications for, again, everything that, that depends on earthquake catalogs uh, and the quality of them. Um, we also have kind of a, a long-standing problem in seismology that I, I mentioned briefly before, which we call the phase association problem. And it's basically um, given an unknown number of earthquakes, or even none, and a set of phase detections across your whole seismic network, you want to assign each of these phase detections to the event that caused it. And so um, you can look at a cartoon like this, where we basically have station latitude in some normalized sense here versus time. And so each of these little circles here represents um, a phase detection that's made somewhere within the seismic network. And so if we apply one of these types of approaches I mentioned before, where you basically make all these picks, you can think of reducing this very high dimensional data set to a handful of discrete trigger times that are distributed across your network. And so you end up with something like this, where you have potential move out patterns like this for different seismic waves. Maybe they might be overlapping like this. And then you have other stuff here that you want to discard altogether. And so you basically have some kind of supervised clustering problem where the rules of clustering um, get with this are basically characterized by the physics of wave propagation in the Earth. And so a trained expert can look at something like this and recognize that this looks like a seismic wave. It's got a move out shape associated with it. If you look at record sections, you can do the same thing. Basically, the idea that we're going to talk about here is using deep neural nets to do the same kind of thing. So learning to recognize the characteristics that seismic waves make as they sweep across a network. Um, so. Uh, the algorithm I'm going to talk about using here is based on recurrent neural nets. Um, and so these are, you know, they're, they're not quite the same as the other types that I talked about before because they're based on working with data that has a sequential structure to it. So um, with typical neural nets, fully connected ones, they lack any kind of mechanism for learning sequential structure and data. So um, our recurrent neural nets, they basically achieve this with uh, an internal memory state of some kind. And so you can think of passing in some kind of sequence, one element at a time like this, and making some kind of prediction here, and feeding part of that information that you've extracted from this back in, so that when you process the next time step, you can use the context from the previous one to help make a better prediction for the next one. And you can keep looping over each element, and of course the more elements that you have, 
the more context that you have. Um, and so these types of neural nets are state-of-the-art or have been state-of-the-art recently um, in many areas of, of, um, of artificial intelligence, including speech recognition, speech synthesis, um, that kind of thing. And there's a couple different variants here. Um, one is called a long short-term memory network, and another one is called a gated recurrent unit. Um, they have different properties. Um, but for the purpose of this talk today, they're basically um, very similar. And so, again, the idea with these is that they can take in a sequence and extract um, the context from that sequence and use that information to make a better informed prediction. So um, we developed this algorithm. We call this phase link. It's basically a deep neural net approach to the seismic phase association problem. And it's designed to basically take all of these picks as shown in this cartoon here and treat them as a sequence. So each one of these picks is tagged by a latitude of the, latitude of the station and, and its longitude, the time that it occurs at, the type of phase that we think it is. And if you sort them in order, then this becomes your sequence. And so um, the idea is that we have a model that for um, a given window of picks, and in our case, it's going to be 500 of them, we basically want to take those 500 picks and make 500 predictions, one for each of the picks. We want to predict which of these 500 picks should be linked to the very first one within that 500. And so it's basically a binary sequential prediction problem. We simply want to link picks together that we think came from the same event. Somehow we have a model that learns to do this. And so um, let's say that we input this here, which only has six for the cartoon, and it scores this one a one because it's from the same event as itself. We think this one should be from the same event as the first one, but this one should not. It should be discarded. And then one, one, and zero here. And so we end up with some linking structure here um, because we have a model that learns how to do this. So we basically have a model that um, is designed to, given a set of training data with ground truth, to learn to recognize wavefronts um, and make these predictions accordingly. So um, we can do this basically for this sliding window here. And so for basically, if you do this, every pick becomes the root pick within the window at any point in time, or, or I mean, at, at one point or, or another. And so you can basically do this for all possible lags of the sliding window. And you build a big, highly sparse matrix, which basically breaks up automatically all of the, the picks into uh, a graph, essentially. So it defines how each one is linked to all the other ones. Um, and so it's basically learning to recognize these patterns because they make the shapes that, that seismic waves make as they sweep across a network. So um, we can solve this phase association problem just by giving it ground truth somehow um, and doing this kind of similar to the way that a human can do it. So if you look at record sections, you know, a hundred times, a uh, human could look at a record section from a totally different region but somehow see that there's this seismic wave sweeping across the network and we know this, this kind of characteristic shape. Well, here we have these neural nets that are basically learning to do the same um, kind of operation. So um, I talked about a bunch of different algorithms here. We can take this kind of phase detection part and couple it to um, this association part. And we can run this thing end to end on a big chunk of continuous data. Here I'm taking data from Southern California. This is three years of continuous data for all of these stations here where we detect like 86,000 events. And, and these are all the locations that come out of this which is something like five times as many events over that three-year period as we had uh, before. And of course, I think this is going to continue to improve more and more um, as our algorithms get better and so forth. But um, this is starting with absolutely nothing. It's just raw waveform data, end-to-end -end detection with a catalog. And so to be clear, this has always been a non-trivial exercise to do this. People spend years collecting data trying to get to the point where they can build their catalog that they can use for their projects that they're interested in, whether it's you know, these short-term deployments or things like that. Building catalogs from scratch with no knowledge of the area is, has been a barrier. And so here, we're hoping that this can kind of streamline this process significantly, which is going to, I think, move everything a lot uh, forward. So here's just some quick examples of this. So here's some size of waves detected. Uh, and it turns out that we typically end up with many more S picks now than P picks, which is kind of the opposite problem than we had before. Now the P waves tend to be pretty attenuated at far distances, but the S waves are still slightly above the noise level. And so we can kind of, we can zoom in over here 
we can see that this stuff is starting to basically nail seismic wave onsets even at very low SNR conditions where we would never have a human being uh, picking that because they wouldn't be confident at doing it. So, um, okay, the last example I'll just mention very briefly is that we can also do this for focal mechanisms. And so um, we took a data set of almost 5 million first motion polarities, which are used to construct these, um, these beach ball plots, which tell us how the fault moved and, and the direction that it moved in. Um, and typically we do this by measuring whether the ground moves up or down at every given site and then reconstructing um, the fault planes accordingly. So um, we took this model that learns to measure these first motion polarities. We can run it on here, it's about 150,000 earthquakes. And we can compare the polarities that come out to what the humans can do and invert them for focal mechanisms. And so um, here we basically have polarity misfit um, so smaller values are better and the number of focal mechanisms that come out of this operation. And so you can see that um, for the machine, the misfit is lower and we get many more focal mechanisms out. And this is not about overfitting because there's only three parameters here. It's for the exact same set of events between both data sets except we get many more focal mechanisms out. So, um, so we, we, we can conclude from this that the machines actually do a better job than the humans do. And it's not just on this, it's actually the, um, also the first motion polarities. We found that something like 20% of all the polarities that the humans were, were picking are probably wrong. And so the machines are doing a better job because they're picking the opposite sign for these. So, um, so there's a lot of promise here because this is completely automated. You just take a data set of hundreds of thousands of events and it spits out basically focal mechanisms as a result. So, okay, so looking forward. Um, you know, seismology, because of these large label data sets and data driven problems, um, has really quickly become a leader in applying machine learning to, um, to our domain. And um, what, what I'm seeing really here is that, you know, over all these decades, we've had this general inability to build earthquake catalogs from scratch for arbitrary data sets on demand. Um, that's always been a barrier for all the downstream analysis that we do. And so machine learning is providing basically end-to-end -end solutions that are making these barriers disappear and very quickly. Um, and so, you know, I think this is going to transform experimental seismology where you have some science question that you're interested in. Now I can actually deploy all my instruments, collect the data and quickly build catalogs which I can use for the, the actual questions that I'm interested in. Um, you know, it used to be, in the, it's always been that people spend years trying to get to the point where they can actually do the real science they care about because we didn't really have these types of techniques um, that can work on arbitrary data sets on demand. So uh, I think that's really an important takeaway from all of this. And uh, the last part is that these automated measurements that are coming out of this are basically as good or, or potentially better than um, the human ground truth. And so that means that we're going to be looking at much more expanded catalogs better locations that come out of all this stuff, improved tomography studies, improved understanding of earthquakes and faults and imaging the fault, better understanding of earthquake source properties and every single thing um, that comes downstream that depends on all this information. So um, I think it's really exciting uh, where we are right now and so I, I, I'm looking forward to the future. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. We, we just have time really for one question. Uh, I. I'm actually going to go ahead and well, one in addition to what I'm going to ask as well. I mean, it seems like the obvious point, though, is that you're working with an immense data set. So the learn that you have pre-existing data sets for the machine learning, the ma a large, I, I'm not, um, let's say most experiments that are these days are, new, they're, are going to new areas where we don't have that benefit or uh, we may have a single um, nearby permanent station within the area. So it, it, it's, not a, it's not a solution to all of the kinds of problems and it's directly relevant to thinking about how SAGE and GAGE and new facilities are actually um, going to be implemented and how, how experiments will be run as well. Do you have a comment? or and Maybe we could talk about this later as well. But yeah, um, We found from extensive testing over many regions that um, for these problems that uh, the data sets that we use for Southern California, for example, train, uh, they, they generalize quite well to other regimes. And so that's very important. Uh, there are some cases where we've seen where things break down a bit, potentially 
four steps are much different, so the polarization is, is quite different. But um, there, there are a number of great examples where these things generalize very well. And so, um, I mean, we've taken data from Southern California. We apply it to induced data sets at shallow depths okay. in other countries. I mean, it's just, um, it, it functions quite well. Yeah. This is maybe a related question. Uh, you mentioned that the models are even better, you think, than uh, human ground truth data sets, but your models are Sure. Um, well, so they've seen this in computer vision too, where um, they have taken data sets like ImageNet, um, which is basically labeled images from, from humans. Um, and they're at a point where the machines actually can do better than, um, than the humans can. And so you can estimate the error on, on human, the human error by basically putting a bunch of people in a room and having them each measure the same image and, and, and tell you what they think it is. And so um, the variance on that is the error rate. Then you run the machine algorithm on it and it does better than this. So they can actually quantify what the, the baseline is for, um, for the human error and show that now um, these deep neural nets are, are outperforming uh, the right. human capabilities. So, so that would be estimating the error rate of the model compared to the human error labeling rate. But I'm asking about mistakes that humans are commonly making. Like you mentioned that humans may not be labeling a certain type of wave because they might not be confident. They never would have labeled it. Right. So if they're not labeling it, how, um, how is that influencing your model's predictions? Why, why is it maybe labeling things that, the, that were not included in, in the training data set? Not for that specific yeah. example, but in general. Because there's still generalization properties. I mean, how far you can generalize away from examples that, you, um, that you've seen only in the past is, is not exactly clear. It's very problem dependent. But there's certainly still generalization properties. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, it's a great question, but there's, um, there's a lot there. I, and I, I imagine we can return to that uh, in the discussion at the end. But I think it's time now to move to Diego. Do you want to be mic'd up? I'll, I'll use the Okay. And so uh, the last speaker in this session is Diego Melgar, who will talk about rapid forecasts of earthquake hazards from crustal deformation patterns. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a completely different problem. And uh, thanks for the invitation, first of all, to speak here today. I'm going to discuss um, how we can make short-term forecasts, i.e. in minutes, of earthquake hazards from onshore geophysical data. And I'm going to focus on my favorite sensor, which is uh, GNSS. But this, I hope, it will extend to other um, geophysical measurements as well. This is very much work in progress, so what I'm going to show you here has some component of still aspirational, but it's uh, been a big collaboration. Mostly this is Junting Ling's uh, PhD thesis, but also a lot of work from two very talented postdocs and uh, two colleagues in the department who've taken on different bits of this. We've benefited enormously, this goes to Carrie Ann's point, we've benefited enormously from the fact that uh, the supercomputer on campus hired a research staff for data science the same week I was hired. So we benefited a lot from interactions with them as our sort of ground truth of what if when we frequently ask them if what we're doing in terms of data science and machine learning is stupid or not. And they're a great uh, way of uh, checking that up for us. So uh, I'm going to start by focusing on one problem. This extends to other earthquake hazard problems, but this in many ways is the easier one. And that is local tsunami warning. So I'll direct you to this uh, map over here. This is a simulated magnitude 8.2 earthquake. And these are the arrival times for the first peak of amplitude at the local coastline. And this is just to situate you in how quickly we need to respond. The times are down here. So the first arrivals right off so offshore, uh, right offset the earthquake are about 17 minutes. Um, this is a good situation. If the earthquake were down here where the continental shelf is shorter, we're looking more at like the eight to nine uh, minute time frame in terms of when the arrivals happen. So we need to characterize the earthquake and we need to characterize the hazard very quickly. And local tsunami warning remains a challenging problem in all tsunami prone regions. Uh, different parts of the world deal with it in different ways. Japan probably deals with it the best, but nobody deals with it perfectly or well at all. 
in many cases. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on real-time GNSS. Most of you might know this is what a GNSS station looks like. It's an antenna firmly coupled to the ground via a geodetic monument. And when the earthquake moves, or when the earthquake starts, I'm going to wind that again, uh, you'll get this beautiful uh, signal of the deformation uh, across the crust. In this case, I'm showing the Tohokuoki uh, magnitude 9 earthquake. You don't need to be a crack seismologist to figure out that the source is mostly around there, and that if things moved about five meters, then it's probably um, a big event. So we want to exploit uh, this kind of pattern. Here are a few other examples. This is another very large event, the Maule earthquake in 2010, a magnitude 8.8, .8, also with about five meters of crustal deformation across a much sparser network. Um, but the important thing about Maule and that I want to impress upon you is when you think about GNSS, don't just think about these arrows, these vectors pointing out to sea. What's important about GNSS is also its time history. How do we get from no deformation to the final static deformation? So this station that moves five meters, here's its time series in the north, east, and up direction. How we get to those five meters of deformation, there's a lot of richness and detail in that trajectory. And that's also a pattern that we want to exploit when we characterize the earthquake and we characterize the hazard itself. So there is some simple correlations uh, between GNSS and tsunami impacts. If the earthquake, if the GNSS signal is large, the tsunami is large. Um, that much is quite obvious. We see that in Tohokuoki, and we see that in Maui, where five meters of crustal deformation produce tsunamis in the 20 to 30 meter uh, range. Uh, in the 2015 Iapel earthquake, we see somewhat more muted displacements, about two meters, because that earthquake is a little smaller, magnitude 8.3, but we still see also a very large um, tsunami. And this pattern of all the stations lurching out to sea is always a telltale sign of a traditional megathrust earthquake. But the crustal deformation patterns also tell us when maybe the tsunami is going to be a little bit more muted. Here are some examples from the magnitude 8.3 Tohoku Oki earthquake, where we see uh, only about 50 centimeters of crustal deformation that lead to a tsunami that's only in the one to two meter range. Same thing for the Ikike earthquake in 2015, a magnitude 8.1, where we only have a two meter tsunami. And the Ecuador earthquake a year after, where we only have a one meter tsunami from one meter um, of crustal uh, displacement. Um, of course, the correlation is not simple. Some broad scale features like big, big, uh, big crustal deformation equals big tsunami are simple, but the details are not simple at all. So what we're trying to exploit is the fact that when an earthquake breaks the megathrust, if you look at this cutaway of the oceanic slabs subducting beneath the continental mantle, what gets recorded at the top on the continental crust is the deformation caused by heterogeneous slip. It's never just 10 meters. It's never just 30 meters. Whether you get 10 meters deep in the megathrust or 10 meters shallow in the megathrust, that's going to generate a very different tsunami. So we need to capture that variable behavior at the subduction zone interface. And indeed, when we do uh, traditional slip inversion, uh, that's what we see. We see heterogeneous uh, slip all across the megathrust. This is a very well-known uh, feature of earthquakes. There's nothing new here. But we need to capture that complexity because where the slip is happening leads to where the deformation is happening. And eventually, it drives what the tsunami is going uh, to look like. And you can see here how complex that can be. For that same magnitude 8.3 earthquake, when we calculate the vertical deformation that starts the tsunami, uh, we get this very complex signal. This is from traditional seismological techniques from slip inversion. We see this upper slope, three meters of, up, of uplift, uh, three meters of uplift in the middle to lower slope. And of course, this is going to lead to two packets of tsunami generation, two big waves, and it also drives when the tsunami arrives. But importantly, if we look at a GNSS station on shore, we see that while this isn't exactly measuring this uplift and subsidence, if you squint, you can kind of see these sort of three periods of growth. You see the growth in the GNSS, a little break, growth in the GNSS, a little break, and then the final growth to the static offsets. This time variability is related to the same features of the earthquake that make this patch of uplift and this patch of uplift. So we want to use this temporal information in addition to the size of the offset to characterize the earthquake and to characterize uh, the tsunami itself. Of course, the, the one thing that is also very important about GNSS is that these crustal deformation patterns also tell you when something is not that hazardous. The most poignant example is this magnitude 7.9 earthquake that happened offshore Alaska um, early last year where there was, it was a strike slip event, so lateral faulting, almost no vertical deformation, so only a very small 
modest tsunami, 20 centimeters, but the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, sorry, the National Tsunami Warning Center, who's in charge of this area, they don't currently use GNSS operationally. So the watchstanders, what they saw in real time in the first 15 minutes was magnitude 8 close to the trench in the subduction zones. So they naturally issued a far and wide warning uh, to all of Alaska and the Pacific uh, and the U.S. West Coast saying there's likelihood of a large uh, tsunami. GPS easily reveals that because in the crustal deformation patterns, instead of seeing that familiar lurching out to sea of everybody, you would see what seismologists will understand is that four-lobed pattern of deformation characteristic of a strike-slip earthquake. So GNSS captures that as well. But perhaps what's most exciting about GNSS is that it also captures or helps you to identify uh, tsunami earthquakes. This is a boogeyman if, if you've ever worked in tsunami science. Tsunami earthquake um, is a term that I'm not in love with, but it's part of our vernacular in seismology. Tsunami earthquake produces a tsunami that is much larger than what you would expect for its magnitude. So the most recent example we have is the Menta Y earthquake in Indonesia, only a magnitude 7.8 that produced a 15 meter tsunami with widespread devastation and a large loss of life in the Menta Y and the Nias Islands. Now these are very difficult. Um, here are results of the tsunami survey conducted by Emma Hill. You will see that the, in some parts the inundation or the run up was up to 17 or 18 meters. So this is a very, very, very large event. In a recent paper, we were finally given access to the local seismic data. And what we found is to me very striking. If you compare uh, the seismic recordings from similarly sized events in other parts of the world, not tsunami earthquakes, just traditional mega thrust events, you'll see what looks like regular strong motion seismograms roughly of the same size. These stations are roughly the same distance from their uh, causative earthquakes. Nothing too surprising there. But when we look at the Menta Y earthquake, you almost see no ground motion associated with that event. There is almost no shaking associated with that tsunami earthquake. Um, so these events are, are terrifying because the shaking is like only a magnitude six, but the tsunami is like a magnitude nine. And it makes them incredibly challenging to identify in an operational setting. Here too, GNSS can help. Of course, we know that the reason that these uh, tsunami earthquakes happen is because they're breaking the shallow most part of the mega thrust with incredibly large slip. In this slip inversion by Han Yue and Thorn Lei, you'll see up to 20 meters of slip in only a magnitude 7.7 .7 to 7.8 earthquake. Meanwhile, more traditional subduction zone earthquakes of the same magnitude are deeper in the mega thrust. You'll see them here in Costa Rica, this one in Chile, also in Chile, and in Ecuador, they have two, three, four, five meters of slip. And because they're deep, they don't generate um, a large tsunami. GNSS sees this. If you look at the um, GNSS recordings for all of these events, you'll see a traditional pattern in the normal or common uh, mega thrust events with a short abrupt rise to a large peak displacement. Meanwhile, in the tsunami earthquake in Menta Y, you see this very, very long drawn out growth to the final uh, deformation uh, from the earthquake. This is exactly what we want an al algorithm to be able to do, to say, the magnitude of the event is 7.8 or 7.9 because the displacement is of a certain size. But we also wanted to look at the trajectory so that it can say something uh, more educated than just the magnitude. So our working hypothesis has been for some time that time dependent onshore crustal GNSS can be used to forecast something that is occurring offshore to forecast the tsunami impact. Because in that time series of GNSS, you have information that correlates strongly to what is happening offshore to the deformation of the seafloor that eventually causes a tsunami. But the relationships are not simple, and there's many sort of edge cases that we need to worry about, like tsunami earthquakes. So traditional seismological algorithms like uh, scaling laws, moment tensor inversions, slip inversions, they work well for some of the events, but it's hard to build an algorithm that works well in real time for every single instance of what is possible. So if I said uh, complex correlation, the first place your mind goes to is, well, we need machine learning. Uh, to solve, to demark draw the lines of demarcation in those correlations. Um, the problem that we face is that, thankfully, large earthquakes are rare. So we do not have a real uh, training data set of large earthquakes um, to use. So what we do is we solve that through simulation. We take uh, the step of simulating as many large earthquakes as we can in a variety of situations, some of them tsunami earthquakes, some of them traditional mega thrust events, and use that as our training data set for the machine learning uh, algorithm. Um, of course, as I just said, 
these need to be realistic. This is a big challenge. How do you know that that magnitude 9.2 that the computer just spit out, how do you know that that and its associated GNSS waveforms are what earthquakes actually do? And can we train a time-dependent machine learning algorithm that takes not just the growth of the GPS, but the path that it takes uh, to make evaluations of, about the earthquake and forecast um, the hazards? We, do a, we take a two-step approach uh, to solve this. First, we have a fairly efficient uh, code called FakeQuakes that creates stochastic slip distributions based on the, on the work of uh, Martin Murray and, and, and Greg Barroza. This is uh, now 17 years old, but it's with, with the test of time very well, uh, where we can make stochastic slip patterns and then apply a set of kinematic rules to make those patterns go uh, in time. We try our best to make these uh, kinematic models always correlate well to reality. We do have a few large events to compare against, and we are always making those comparisons to make sure that things make sense. Everything in this code is a tunable parameter, so if you want to argue with me about why that value and not some other value, you can take the code base, apply some other value, and see yourself what the results and the changes will be. Um, what's best uh, or what's nice about fake quakes is that we've, we've put in a lot of effort to parallelize it so we can very efficiently generate uh, tens of thousands of simulations across a large GNSS network. Here's an example uh, for Cascadia, uh, a magnitude 8.6, and you see these uh, arrows unfolding uh, as the pulse of slip propagates through um, the slip distribution, and we generate uh, the one hertz uh, time series of deformation. Uh, the nice thing about GPS is that it's relatively simple, so we can use a realistic earth structure and everything is deterministic. There's no, uh, even though the source process is stochastic, the propagation through the earth remains deterministic. So any structure that you put in there will be reflected in the resulting waveforms. The other piece of this is that GeoClaw, which is the tsunami, back two, forward one, one more, there we go which is this uh, tsunami modeling code out of the University of Washington uh, created by uh, applied mathematicians there. GeoClaw has come a long way since we first started working with it. It is now GPU and CPU uh, enabled, so it runs very, very quickly, and it can, allows you to simulate the tsunami across a very large uh, domain. This is an example for the Tohoku Oki earthquake, and it also allows you to inundate the shoreline. So it's not just a reflecting boundary condition here. You can actually see what happens as the tsunami uh, inundates and has overland flow. Um, recently, they added uh, some adjoint uh, method trickery to GeoClaw so that you're only refining the parts of the model um, that you care about, and you can ignore uh, parts of the domain, like down here, where there's no tsunami propagation and you don't need to know about what's going on there. So we take these two pieces, fake quakes to make earthquakes and GeoClaw to make tsunamis, uh, to develop the data, the, the data set that we're going to use for training. We use, even though our end goal is to work on Cascadia, at least that's my goal because I live there, um, the, what we're focused on now is Chile, because Chile actually has had some large events that have been recorded by GNSS. It has had exactly five, which might not sound like much to you, but it's more than zero. So the Kike earthquake in 8.2 and its aftershock of 7.7, the EFL earthquake in 8.3, Maule in 8.8, .8, and Malinka 7.6. So it actually spans a pretty good uh, magnitude range. So what we do is we've generated 50,000 simulations across uh, the megathrust using a realistic slab geometry in a very broad magnitude range. And we synthesize the GNSS at 121 stations of what is right now today the Chilean operational GNSS network. And we use these five events um, as ground truth, as validation. Forward. This is what the data looked like for one of these very large events. This is for a magnitude 9.3, a station really close to the earthquake sees about nine meters of crustal deformation in the west direction with some uh, corresponding uplift and north signal. Okay, so we need a temporarily dynamic algorithm because it's not just about the size of this, it's about how you got there and about every single little detail in uh, the GNSS. And of course, to those who know about machine learning, this screams RNN, uh, so that's what we use. We use a recurrent neural network. Um, not gonna dwell on this too much. Zach did a, a pretty nice job of explaining that, but we want exactly what he described. We want to input the GNSS at five seconds. Whatever the earthquake is in the first five seconds, put that into the neural network and make a prediction about what the magnitude is at five seconds. I'm gonna start with magnitude and work my way slowly towards forecasting hazards. But we also want information to make it through, such that at the next five-second interval, 
you put in what the GNSS network is doing at 10 seconds, but you also need whatever happened before to make the prediction about the magnitude at 10 seconds. And you want this to keep going uh, uh, to 15 seconds, to 20 seconds, to 30 seconds. And we use a plain vanilla LSTM uh, implementation of our RNN, and it works um, quite well. We've barely made uh, any modifications to this. So the way to think about the problem is you have these vertical slices where each one of these slices is a scenario uh, with its 121 GPS stations. And what we do is we take cuts at five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, and that's what goes into the training and into making the predictions um, of the earthquake magnitude. That's what we're asking the LSTM, uh, the RNN to do. Now there's some important implementation features um, that, about the training that, that end up mattering a lot. Uh, so the way we do the training is we pick one rupture randomly from all the available simulations and we add realistic GNSS noise. This is very, very, very important because we also want the algorithm to be um, robust and to not just classify any little blip in the GPS time series as a hazardous event. We know from real analysis of what is happening in real-time GNSS networks worldwide, we have a pretty good model of GNSS noise. So we just make random draws from this uh, GNSS noise model and put it into the simulated data. One of the most important things is we have to randomly remove stations you, because 121 stations are not always recording every event. Stations drop out, stations are being maintained. For some of these events, the stations didn't even exist at the time. So we remove anywhere between 10 and 100 stations uh, from the GNSS uh, packet of data and put that uh, into the training. We do that with an existence code stations get either a zero or a one if they're participating or not participating in that particular training step. Rinse, repeat, and train as many times as you can. Uh, we, we train with 80% and we leave out 20% of the data as a first uh, cut for validation. Importantly, the labels here are the final magnitudes of the events. We assume that a magnitude nine and a magnitude eight look different at five seconds, at 10 seconds, at 15 seconds. We make that assumption and ask the RNN to find the patterns that distinguish an eight from a nine. So this is how the RNN does after it's fully trained. What you're looking at here is the actual magnitude in the simulation. This is only a thousand events uh, from the validation data set versus what is predicted um, in terms of, of magnitude. And the dashed line is a one-on-one -on -one correspondence line. So you see behavior that you perhaps would expect at 30 seconds, uh, there's a lot of scatter because basically at 30 seconds, a nine and an eight and a half still look very, very similar. So it's very hard uh, to make that prediction and say with a lot of certainty that you've collapsed onto knowing uh, the correct magnitude. That scatter, of course, goes down as time goes on and as more information from more stations uh, becomes available. Now, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, and even though the validation data is great and all, it's still simulations. So what we're most interested in is what is the performance for these five real events that actually recorded uh, GNSS data. So here's the first test. This is the KK earthquake in magnitude 8.1, and this is the time varying prediction from the RNN, which by the way, has never seen this data. We've never put the real events into training. Um, the performance is quite good, I would say, uh, there's some interesting things. So here's the, what the actual GNSS data looks like. Um, I'm sorry this is so small, but you can see that by 10 or 20 seconds, you actually already have about 20 centimeters of deformation signal at the closest site, and yet the RNN chooses to ignore that completely. We've noticed that the RNN does not like to make single station predictions. It seems to want to wait for more confirmation from more sites, and that's certainly true for the Iquique earthquake. There's some overshoots because there's memory, so even if this station has reached its final growth and coming down, the other stations coming below might still be growing. So we've also noticed this sort of dynamic overshoot uh, effect in the magnitude prediction. We see that for Iquique. We see that for the Iapel earthquake as well, where this is a magnitude 8.3, same sort of slow growth, or well, it's still pretty fast, but not as fast as I would like it to be, overshoot and then convergence to a final magnitude. Same situation here, there's a station here with already 30 or 40 centimeters of deformation by about 20 or 30 seconds, but the RNN waits for confirmation um, from more sites, we think, that's what we think is going on. Except for the Maui earthquake. And this I think is a very encouraging result. This is a magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake and the convergence to a large magnitude is very, very, very fast. By about 35 seconds, you hit magnitude 8.8 .8 right on the nose. 
And this is mostly with one station, so this orange station. So in this case, the RNN, which doesn't like to make single station predictions, sees such a large and fast deformation signal, you get to about a meter and a half by 30 seconds, that it says, I don't care that this is just the one, it must be a large event and goes ahead and makes a prediction of a large magnitude for that event. So that's very encouraging and important, but in the end, what we're after is forecasting the hazard. In the context of early warning and the context of rapid response, what the earthquake is doing is unimportant. I don't care about its stress drop. I don't care about its slip distribution. I don't care if it was long or wide. What I care about is whether it's going to make a large tsunami or strong shaking. So we modify our algorithm to take the GNSS at 5 and 10 and 15 seconds, and instead of forecast just the magnitude, it outputs every 10 kilometers um, along the coastline a prediction of what the tsunami amplitude is going to be. And of course, we can do this because for every one of the scenarios that we have, we have modeled what the tsunami is going to look like with GeoClaw, and that's what you see here in these bars. This is the model output along the Oregon and Washington coastlines, and the model output across Vancouver Island um, is up here. So we just take the same idea and reapply it in this context. This is very early days. This is what we're working on right now today. So we've only uh, done these sorts of tsunami models for Cascadia. We haven't yet taken this uh, to Chile. But what we're doing is making these predictions over 10 kilometer bins. So this is what you see here, the slip model. And what you see in red is the outcome of the simulation. And the hollowed out bars are what's predicted um, in real time or, or in, in a rapid assessment. And we've also worked with our NOAA colleagues because what they want to see is they don't, they actually don't care about this level of granularity. What they want to see is what they call their threat levels, which is if it's zero to 30 centimeters, it's green, one to three, it's orange, more than three, it's red. This is what NOAA uses. It's different for JMA. So we can very easily go ahead and predict these threat levels because you don't want to make a forecast for one beach and then make a different forecast for another beach um, up the road because the uncertainties are still quite high. So you just sort of downsample that problem and make only one larger forecast. So here's a confusion matrix for how well we can predict those threat levels. Lots of uh, orange and red across the diagonal, but in general, we're over predicting uh, a little bit, which surprises me and I don't have a good explanation for why that is the case. But again, this is ongoing work. We only tested this for Cascadia and the validation here is very, very challenging. Even when we take this to Chile, what we have are a few tide gauges and tsunami survey measurements so we'll validate against that, but it'll still be only uh, a few events. The holy grail is to do inundation modeling. We want to move past this. So saying what the tsunami is going to be at the coastline is well and all, but what we really want to do is we want to know what the overland flow is going to look like at a particular location of interest, say, for example, a nuclear power plant. This is very, very, very hard to do. We know the math and we can uh, run the computer models to do inundation, but it's much slower than just doing the tsunami amplitude at the coastline. And there's a lot more sensitivity to getting the earthquake source right and having details like what is the built environment across this bit of land. You need to have, know those very, very, very well. But I think in the future, we'll be able to make this kind of movie, this kind of map very quickly from the onshore geophysical data. How well that will perform remains to be seen, but I'm, I'm quite hopeful based on these sort of uh, simple findings that will eventually um, get there. So why, why does this work? I, I think it works. I hope I've convinced you that at least it kind of works. Um, I think it's important to recognize that the reason why uh, this approach of using simulations to, to train machine learning algorithms is working is because the physics that we've chosen to use is already pretty well understood. So even if you know, there's a lot of complexity in real earthquake rupture. Whatever these stochastic kinematic models are doing seems to be good enough to replicate what GNSS really does. We know how to show the, we know how to solve the shallow water equations. We know bathymetry and coastlines really well. So once we propagate um, a tsunami, that problem is very well understood. So these modeling steps are very robust and they're validated. They map well to reality, to what we think earthquakes and tsunamis actually do. Very importantly, we can run many of these simulations so we can sample all the possible behaviors that happen during megathrust ruptures. Sorry, I clicked and nothing happens. Of course, you might ask yourselves, okay, if this works uh, for tsunami hazards, why not take this one step further to other kinds of hazards? And that's what we're starting to do. What we want is we want to predict the shake map 
uh, on shore, not just the tsunami, but the shake map. This is a much more challenging problem for large earthquakes um, because we need to basically be able to forecast waveforms like this one. This is a strong motion uh, record section that has a lot more detail than what we would see in GNSS. And in this case, when modeling broadband uh, seismic waveforms, the details of the source and the path, the things that we know for sure we don't know really well, those things become more and more important than they, do, than they are for GNSS. Fake quakes can do this. We can model broadband seismograms. It's a lot slower, but it still works. Um, but because we don't know all those real life details um, and we rely on approximate semi-stochastic methods because there's no way to make forward calculations for 100 hertz waveforms now today, uh, one question you might ask yourself is, do we actually know about, enough about this process for this sort of simulation and machine learning approach to be meaningful? And that's a very valid question. I think maybe, I think possibly at least we can extract things like the broad shaking features across the landscape, but we probably won't be able to predict every single nitty gritty detail of a strong motion seismogram. So that is uh, encouraging, but there's still some things that are very, very, very hard and will likely remain very hard for the foreseeable future. One of them is landslides. Earthquake triggered landslides are incredibly challenging. So here's a magnitude 7.5 earthquake in Palu in Indonesia, a large strike slip fault with a restraining band running right here along the landscape. Comparatively small magnitude for a very large uh, tsunami. There's very good evidence, I'll just start this, there's very good evidence that what triggered uh, the Palu earthquake is a combination of some component of coast seismic deformation, but a lot of landsliding in the bay. Here you see a before and after picture with a beheaded uh, scarp there that fell into the bay. And there's good evidence that what causes uh, the inundation down here in Palu City is mostly the landslides. And right now we have no physical way to connect a forecast of strong shaking to where and how the landslides will be triggered. So we're very far away from making a movie like this uh, in real time. There's no machine learning that's gonna do that right now. So machine learning provides a really great way to establish these complex correlations between uh, GNSS observations and earthquake hazards. And I think, again, as I said, it works well for tsunamis because the underlying physics is fairly well understood. And we can run many, many, many simulations uh, to train um, our RNN. Now the physical connections between earthquakes and some of the other hazards are, are less well understood. Um, but I expect that our knowledge will continue to improve, especially as we see more and more uh, large earthquakes over the coming decades. So we will be able to do better at this. It's likely that well, what we want to do is not just use GNSS. We started with GNSS because it's easy, but we want to be able to pull in every single geophysical sensor into our prediction. Strain, ocean bottom pressure, anything that you can think of should be contributing uh, to these sorts of, of forecasts. Uh, some of the challenges that I, that I foresee are that for earthquake hazards in particular, we still don't know a lot of things. For tsunamis, we don't know a lot about how the wedge deforms. And if we ever wanna do inundation modeling, we need to pin those details down. We don't know why strong shaking is generated preferentially in certain parts of megathrust earthquakes, and more uh, particularly, whether we can find those strong motion generating regions before the earthquakes happen. We don't know how shaking triggers subaerial and submarine landslides. Of course, there's physical models, but um, there's still not a deterministic way of taking a shake map, for example, and pointing it to a landslide inventory and finding the features that correlate one uh, to the other. So we're gonna need, if we're gonna go down this machine learning and simulation path, we need multi-physics codes that simulate all this uh, behavior at a variety of time scales. Um, and because large events are rare and will continue to be rare, thankfully, um, we require these codes to be very efficient and very fast. And finally, I'd like to echo a point that Carrie Ann made, and that's that capacity building remains a real challenge, I think. Even though with things like scikit-learn and TensorFlow and all sorts of stuff, it's, it's a lot easier to break into the field. I think for most Earth scientists, it's still challenging to get into massively parallel computing and to learn about machine learning. Most of us in geophysics are still stuck in classical inverse theory, and that's what is still taught today in most master's and PhD programs. So I think there's a lot of room uh, for improvement there. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish there, and uh, I'll, I'll take any questions if I haven't gone over too, too much. Thank you, Diego. Uh, just, um, just a second to explain what we're going to do next. Just a couple of quick questions for Diego, and then we're going to bring the panel to the front table, or even um, uh, carry on, and uh, Zach, you could start moving up there as well, and then we'll open the floor uh, to some questions. But 
let's see whose hand was up first. You've already spoken. Uh, let's have uh, Richard in a, and I'm sorry. You can ask to the general panel. Uh, thanks, Diego. That was great. I, so I want to try and tease out a little more about where the machine learning is really, you know, adding and, and where it's not adding as much, perhaps. So I want to take the example, the first example you showed, right, of using the, uh, the geodetic stations to come up with the estimate of magnitude. So in that case, do you think you're doing better with machine learning than just using standard kind of inversions to kind of slip on a fault? Yeah, great question. Yes, the answer is, is very much yes. We're not doing better at getting the actual magnitude. Right. We're getting it faster. Okay. Um, and the reason is that it's very hard to use a classical algorithm to use the growth to that peak displacement. Mm. If we just use a peak displacement, we do great. But it's hard to build an algorithm just with linear regressions and stuff like that that takes advantage of how fast that growth is happening. Okay. So the RNN picks that up, and that's why I think the Maule uh, convergence is even faster than what we've done before. So there would be, so, so then, okay, that's great. And so then the other piece, which is sort of a different advantage, as I see it, is when you come to the actual tsunami warning, I mean, the, the tsunami wave height type of estimate, there, the real advantage of the machine learning is that you're simplifying what otherwise is a very large, complex calculation. Right, exactly. We would have to have a moment tensor and a slip inversion and connect that to some deformation of the Earth and run the code and all of that in real time. Yeah. Yeah, just a quick question. Oh, that was really great. Um, so in your example, those are designed for, um, you know, subduction zones where you already have pretty good network distance and distance between stores and receivers. So if I ask the question differently, can you use machine learning to figure out what's the optimum, you know, space between receiver stations and station density in order to issue like soon enough warning for a given uh, magnitude in this area where you already know what the big uh, maximum yes. um, earthquake magnitude could happen. Sure. That's a great question, Mohan. Um, yes. And that's something that we're doing now is trying to understand why some of the simulations are doing better than uh, we have so many simulations that we haven't had time to tease out why some are working well. I don't know if you noticed, but we have a slightly low bias for the large magnitude event. Why is that happening is not something that we understand yet. Um, as uh, Kerian said, actually getting at what the inside of the algorithm is doing and why it's choosing to do what it does is not simple. But we can ask questions like, are the sparse network, because we remove stations, are the events with uh, sparse networks, is there a, a threshold at which we achieve peak performance? We can do analysis like these, but we haven't done them. Yep. Great. And Tor has a very quick question. Well, it, it's a follow-up to Richard's question, really, and it's a little bit to, to, to the whole panel. You illustrated some of the uncertainties in terms of going from an earthquake of a certain magnitude to a tsunami, right? And there are surprises. You mentioned some other things, right? The rheological behavior of the wedge is very important. In, in this context, I wonder how the machine learning can ever do better than improving our estimate of the variations, right? Because uh, you, you, you sort of sample everything, and that will give us you know, the range much better, right? It's range with physics rather than some sort of attenuation relationship. But, but what, we are, what you're trying to do is to get the specific, right, the particular out of it. And, and it seems that that very much then depends on the specifics of the rupture. And yeah. so I'm not sure how you would get out of that I, I don't problem. think it would do better. Yeah. I don't think it would do better. So if we ever want to make something like this operational at NOAA, we have to be very liberal with the simulations in terms of what we think is possible and just generate strike slip events, outerize normal fault events, shallow events, events with plasticity, events with no, just as many as you can and see what the output is and just stick that all into the machine learning um, algorithm such that the next big event has no surprises. Some part of its behavior will have been captured in the simulation. So this very much relies on us knowing what the, what the science has solved and putting it in there. This is not discovering uh, new science. Perhaps if we look at why the algorithm works, We'll find some insights in terms of what is important, but this very much relies on the physics being prescribed by me or by, by my PhD student. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, Diego, I think it's it, it's great that we start this discussion session on, on this topic because, in a way, it's not the standard pure physics approach or blue skies research. It's a specific task for hazard that 
also bridges multiple funding agencies as well, the sponsors for this committee. And so I, I think it's, you know, it's just good to bring that up as well. Um, I think another point that was common to many of these as well is where geosciences and data sciences, where geosciences leads and where, where we need to draw in resources or expertise from data sciences. And you know, getting, getting a better feel for what your recommendations are would be really helpful as well as we move forward. Um, you, you know, we talked about benchmarks and, and limitations of benchmarks, uh, um, how we, how we uh, approach some of those obstacles. And then obviously, um, you know, the, the um, desire to make discoveries or allow for discoveries as well. So I, I'd just like to open the floor now, and I believe that others from, can anyone from outside pose questions as well? Okay, so we'll see how that goes. So, so now we just open the floor uh, to, to general questions to Annie or all. Uh, Matt? Yes, thanks uh, for three great talks. Um, I, I just wanted to start with uh, Diego's last point for and get your feedback from all three of you on capacity building. Um, sort of how are you imagining um, educating uh, both yourself, I guess some of you came from data science backgrounds, some of you came from geophysics, uh, and your students uh, going forward, what are effective ways of teaching uh, students, uh, you know, to, as in the name of the, the today's workshop, to go beyond the black box, to, to sort of take to this next step of of trying to make either discoveries or digging into what the algorithms are actually telling you to get beyond just uh, automation or whatever else um, is sort of routine at this point. Um, yeah, I I think we're going to have to educate a whole new generation of students to do this. Uh, I'm teaching a class at Caltech in machine learning and geophysics. Um, the goal is to talk about problems that are that are common to the types of data that we all work with, multivariate time series and thinking about um, working them in that way and um, the challenges that, that we're going to have going forward, the lack of ground truth for a lot of things. I mean, there's not necessarily answers to some of these questions um, right yet, but um, I think it's important to get people thinking about them at this time and, um, and aware of these issues, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think I guess I'm thinking beyond a class. So I think you know, there's there's single classes. I'm thinking it's going to be really more of a curriculum, of you know, do you take students that have sort of a, a double major in data science and geophysics, or is it you really want someone to start in geophysics and then you train them as a graduate student in data science? I mean, I'm sure there's multiple answers to this, but I, have you thought through you know what is the the step forward to make a progress on this? Um. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, it in a lot of ways this resembles um, what happened with Inversphere in the 1970s. So, um, yeah, people from different backgrounds are going to be, uh, become, I think, very important here. Uh, the people that can uh, that are fluent in all the computer science, applied math, um, will be very helpful for translating uh, this type of technology into geosciences. Um, you know, there's obviously it's broader than just than just geoscience. But again, like I said before, there are a lot of challenges that are kind of either common or, or unique to, to geoscience that that helps too. So, you know, we do obviously need domain experts. Um, it's not going to be just you fit one generic model to everything and it just figures everything out. I think we're going to very quickly kind of um, recognize what we can and can't do with the existing types of models that are kind of off the shelf within these software packages. And then beyond that, it's going to take people that are very well educated in, um, in machine learning algorithms um, and also understand uh, the structure of the data sets that we work with, that you can very carefully design new things. Um, I think that's the next level, but we're nowhere near there yet. Yeah. Could I, can I just, as you're talking about the education, could you comment on the level. I mean, these are these are levels that I, I'm assuming you're you're recommending that we start at undergraduate level. That, that's what I, was, what I was going to say. I, rather embarrassingly, at the University of Oregon, until last year, you, a geologist could graduate without knowing how to code. So um, I think you need to overhaul the entire earth science curriculum such that uh, web services or cloud computing and programming languages and this kind of stuff becomes as fundamental a tool as Microsoft Excel is to them right now. 
And we're very far away from that. So geophysicists are sure are great at coding most of the time, but other colleagues of ours in the earth sciences, not so much. And simply because they haven't been afforded those opportunities to discover that they don't suck at coding. They just were never taught it the right way. And we need to do better at that. Yeah, so I'm coming at, a, at this from a little bit of a different perspective, having come sort of into geosciences through data and computational sciences. And one of the things that I think is um, there are some sort of, you know, challenges coming from that direction, but something that I've noticed, I know a lot of other people with my background who work in other fields, like they work with material scientists or they work in biology. And I think in some of those other fields, there's a greater recognition that and biology, I think, is a good example. Like there's a field called computational biology. There's a field called biostatistics. And there's people who are specifically trained in that. There's specific curricula. Um, and there's, you know, specific journals or specific conferences, these kind of things. I think in the physical sciences broadly and in geosciences, there's not as much of a recognition that this needs to be a specific, I think, um, its own sort of field and area of expertise. I think you get a lot of people who are, um, you know, trained as geoscientists and then they learn about deep learning and they get really into it and they know that one method maybe really well and they get good at applying it to problems, but they don't have the sort of broad background that say computational biologists who know, you know, they learn the science, they learn the biology, but they're fundamentally trained more as computer scientists who know some biology and know how to work and talk to and work with, um, collaborate with biologists. Um, and so I think that that is what I would see as a direction um, in terms of the level. I don't know if it's something that would make sense at the, I think it's sort of the graduate level. That's something where it would maybe come in. But I do agree that I think in order to prepare people to go into those kind of areas, there needs to be more education at the undergraduate level so that, you know, people who are majoring in, say, geology feel like that's a program they can jump into. That it won't be the first time they're seeing taking, you know, linear algebra or the first time that they're taking a programming course. Um, and I think there also needs to be sort of a, more of a willingness to um, try to bring people from computer science in as well, um, have courses that are um, maybe of interest to them as well and sort of get them um, their take. Because right now there's kind of this, like, I think there's like geoscientists who are learning a little machine learning. There are computer scientists, data scientists who have their own sort of research interests. And I think there's a lot of space in between for there to be new methods and development. As you see in computational biology, biology has its own set of challenges. They need their own methods for these. Like you can't just use image processing methods to solve problems in biology, for instance. So you need your own methods. And so I think that there needs to be kind of education in this sort of specific area. Jeff. Yeah, so I had a question. This was uh, partly inspired by uh, Zachary's talk about the sort of the feature extraction process. And Diego also talked about this to some degree that the shape of how it goes is really a feature extraction. How much, to what degree do you need to put in the filters that try to extract features? Uh, do you just have to like, Try a huge variety of them and see which ones essentially activate, or um, uh, is this something that actually, uh, yeah, is it a lot of trial and error, or is that we're actually we're putting in what we think we know about the physics? Um, so just to clarify, the filters themselves are learned, so you don't specify what those are. Um, you specify the numbers of them for deep learning. Yeah, uh, you specify the number of filters that you have, and kind of dimensions of them and everything else about them is learned. Um, right, but is that from like the, I mean, there's an infinite variety of potential filters. Right. So, so you have some degree of structure in, ter in terms of what things are being tried and what things are then learned, right? Right, so there's no, there's no requirements on it whatsoever. They start as uninitialized parameters and they become something at the end of it. And so that's, that's the whole revolution here with all this is that, um, Decades ago, the standard neural nets, you had to come up with your own parameters that you thought were going to be useful to help you make your predictions. Um, and humans, in fact, back when, um, when deep neural nets were first introduced, the filters were hand chosen. They weren't learned at the time. And so um, people thought that they knew better, right? They, they studied these systems forever and they thought, well, I can reduce that to some equation and I put it in there. And it turned out that when you let the system decide what to do, optimize end to end, that it does better performance wise. So, um, yeah. But, but there is a lot of trial and error. And, and, and even if the end result looks like a beautiful machine learning like plot with all the 
fully connected layers and stuff, there is a lot of trial and error in the architecture of how you go from inputs uh, to outputs. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, um, so that's a great point. Um, there's there's a lot of trial and error, but um, I would say you have to ask at what level do you do you care about this? Yeah. Uh, computer scientist cares a lot more about this than than a geoscientist mm -hmm. would. Um, I would say from my experience with a lot of this is that um, getting the type of model correct, framing the problem the way that you want it to be is much more important than tuning these numbers and other things. So you can, once the model is, is in the right general structure, so it's what exactly you even want to predict in the first place and that kind of thing, um, it tends to get you very close to the right ballpark um, without extensive need for, for tuning of all this stuff. Of course, you can always get better by searching a whole parameter space, but that's, from my perspective, that's less important. So then I guess the key is that you have a, a sufficiently large quantity of data that the, whatever feature you might want to be identifying is, is there in enough repetition in the data that it can be found, essentially. I'm... Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, I would say that's that's true. Yeah, so you can't learn like you're not going to learn a feature if it's not in the data, right? These data-driven methods, it really depends. I think another big aspect of it, um, sort of building on what Zach was saying, is a big uh, piece of this is actually putting together the data sets and getting sort of the data sets um, in a state that where the data set that you're using to train the models is actually going to be useful for the task that you want to do as well. Okay, what I'd like to do um, is to revert back to the capacity building question and take a couple of questions from panelists, and that is uh, Steve Whitmire at Adnan uh Tectonics uh, Program Director right now, um, asked that, you know, for undergraduate curricula, there isn't so much adding, uh, the issue is what you remove to make space. Um, I'm not asking you what we remove, but, you know, there are challenges, I think, um, and Artemis points out, too, that there are younger faculty within department who, who face obstacles in trying to convince folks to, to allow them to teach because we pack our curriculum in interesting ways. So, you know, there, there are folks pointing out challenges. Do we know of, of success stories or particular um, directions forward, uh, strategies that have worked and been effective, are you aware of? So I, I don't I don't think you need to remove that much. So mo most most uh, earth science degrees have some sort of uh, statistics data, some class that you could turn into modern uh, programming. But then you need to add it into all the classes that follow. And, I, and I'll give an example that's going to annoy my fellow geologists. I know how to use a stereo net. There's no reason why I should know how to use a stereo net anymore. We could use that time uh, to teach to take these coding methods that we've learned and put them in stratigraphy and structural geology and, and, and problems like that and teach them how these tools actually help them uh, with those disciplines. So it, you don't have to create a whole slew of new classes. I think you can put it in strategically in other uh, parts of the curriculum. Right. So just to recap, one course and a, a stats course that also covers machine learning and then inclusion of exercises throughout the rest of the curriculum following on and making that an early degree level required course or something like that. Right. Another question that came in, um, can we, what are kind of community resources? The last question from Leah is related to capacity building as well. There's a limited number of institutions with both strong geosciences and data. Can we as a community build resources somewhat potentially like, you know, CIG training courses and or, or as a component even of one of our existing infrastructure, um, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, the panelists and perhaps provoking a more specific question as <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so I mean like CIG is a great example of uh, community hosted code, validation exercises, and then going all the way to end users and teaching them how to use PyLith or SpecFam or stuff before. And it also so, could house benchmarking as yeah, well. Yeah. So I, I don't know what, what more to say this, what, what more to say there other than yes, we should be doing that. So from, uh, this is a great time to have this conversation, right? There's a number of uh, announcements that we've made about future opportunities and changes that we're making to supportive infrastructure and um, in, in terms of the, the competition for Earthquake Research Science Center and uh, competition for a future facility in, in geophysics. 
um, the community, I hope, is thinking carefully about what elements of workforce development that you would like to see uh, supported by those um, uh, different activities. And, and we're here to, to listen and, and see what is of uh, greatest interest. Can I make a related comment to that? But, I mean, isn't there a difference here? And I want to see whether the panel agrees with this. I think, a, to me, I have a sense that there's a big difference between this topic and other topics about high-performance computing and computational capabilities that we've talked about a lot in the past. And that is that the tools that we're talking about, like several of you pointed out, these are openly available tools. TensorFlow is the, the one that most people seem to use. But these are tools that are widely available for a whole range of different kind of approaches, which I think is different to when we've talked about uh, computational resources in the gene sciences before. It's been much more specialized. And so isn't there a difference here that perhaps there's less need for us as geoscientists to be more focused on training students to use these tools because, in fact, these students are learning these anyway. As an example, Berkeley now has a, you know, big data is, every, is big everywhere, of course. Um, the biggest class in Berkeley now for undergraduates is this data science class. And, and the point is that the students are actually now coming with these skills that we're talking about without us doing anything to promote that. And so I, I just wanted to see whether what your sense was, is this different to the computational questions that we've had in our community in the past? If I could just add to that, I was going to ask the same question, but make the point that there are a lot of similarities with the access to high performance computing that we discussed <laughs> in the sense that you know, we've had run meetings where we explored ways of training students, in particular in departments where there's no strong data science program, right, in the use of the leading edge computers. And we felt in the past that we're kind of falling behind here, partially because of workforce training issues. So I, I had the response, wow, there's a lot of similarities, so I'd be curious. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I think that there there is a lot of resources out there already. Um, the The real thing for me is, um, at what point is it is it relevant for for our specific problems, the types of data structures that we encounter, and things like that, right? If you're learning about machine learning in a, in a computer vision context, where everything is about images and there's nothing physical about any of this, um, it's very different from taking something that is discussing multivariate time series the entire time. Um, but I don't think that that's a particularly hard leap to make. Um, I, I mean, like I said, I, I think that this kind of thing could be probably communicated easily through a single class um, focused on applying machine learning to geophysics. I'm regularly working with undergrads and grad students and on applying these tools to these problems, and they've never done any of this stuff before, but they pick it up very quickly. I don't think that it's really kind of a, a huge investment that people have to make um, to get to that point. That, so that's my general, yeah. Okay, could, before I, I take any, any, well, is it related? The question? Yeah, I, I, yeah go ahead. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> One of the things that has to happen for this sort of thing to succeed is that uh, students and, their, importantly, their advisors uh, need to know what's possible. And so Carrie Ann designed a, a short course for the ICME program at Stanford. It's, it was just like three weeks or something. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and say whether you think that would, would work as a, something like that would work as an entry to uh, machine learning methods for geoscientists. Yeah, so I designed this when I was a graduate student. I designed with another student who was working in um, basically computational biology, um, also someone who's coming from a data science background. And it was basically de originally designed for the idea from it came because there are a lot of researchers and fields outside of computer science, outside of statistics, um, these sort of traditional data science fields who are seeing people start to use these methods in their field. They wanted to understand what are these techniques, what can they do, and, and how do we use them. And so we made this course um, sort of for them, um, not for the, the people who weren't going to go and sign up and take, like, you know, the graduate level introductory to machine learning course. It's, um, you know, Stanford is a very popular course, but a lot of people, it's not the first course they want to jump into. It's, you know, really heavy in computing and in mathematics if you just want to get a sense of the field. Um, and so that's where we started. We did have students do hands-on work with, with coding. Um, it wasn't specific to any field. We wanted to keep it broad. But I think you could adapt this to geoscientists because I think, kind of building on what Zach is saying, one of the challenges, I think, 
Um, and I see this a lot when, you know, we're reviewing papers where people are trying to use machine learning and seismology is they take the class, they do the, you know, the some class on Coursera, they do the TensorFlow training, and they often sort of miss like what the, the things that people are doing in computer science, like sometimes those things don't quite apply in, in our sciences in the same way. Like there's differences in the data, there's different challenges. And so if you just take what you've learned in, in computer science and just apply it directly without thinking about the differences between the problems, I mean, if you don't have a deeper understanding of how the methods work, it's easy to sort of think that you're applying them correctly and using them wrong. Um, and I see that a lot in, in, in papers. Um, that get, that get submitted. And I think one of the challenges is that, you know, um, sometimes the, the advisors don't always know either. And so I think that's where these, these collaborations and having this willingness to kind of, um, I think having these kind of short courses are useful for training, like making that leap. I don't think it would need to be like a huge number of courses, but in sort of bringing up these issues, like in, in my presentation, I was talking about what are some of these data challenges. And then you could also, you know, bring up what are these challenges and how could you uh, you know, how do you start to address them or what changes do you need to make to what you're doing? And a class like that could also be useful, I think, for um, computer science students who are interested in applying problems to these fields so they don't jump in and say, I don't know, there's like an XKCD comic where someone's like jumped in, I'm a computer scientist, like I'm going to solve this problem with machine learning or something. And then, you know, the follow-up panels, like six months later, they're like, oh, this problem is hard and I don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> this is harder than I thought. And so I think that's kind of what you have to kind of bridge bridge that gap. So I think it could kind of go in both directions, um, the short course format. Um, did you have faculty who came? Uh, so yes, we did. We had, the first time we offered it was as a workshop and the reason it turned into an actual course was because we had some faculty in the medical school who said, I want my students to take this because the problem they were having is they would teach a machine learning course like for computational biology or in their own field, but the students, if they had had no machine learning, they spent half the course just teaching them the very basics and they wanted to be able to spend that course just focusing on the kind of machine learning techniques that are most useful for their field. So they will maybe want to um, you know, spend the, like in geosciences, you might want to talk about how you use methods with spatial temporal data, time series, but if people don't know the basics of machine learning, that's hard to do. And so they wanted there to be, they, they like the idea of having this course so that students could come in um, with that knowledge already and already a sense of kind of what, what the um, different kinds of methods are that are out there. Um. There are two questions from the, um, before we move on to any other topic, uh, those in the room would like. There are two other questions that came in. Ching Kai um, asked to Diego specifically um, that your training with the synthetic data um, has a systematic underestimation of the magnitude, and you know how do you deal with systematic um, uh, problems within within machine learning as well? I think it's a general problem. I don't know, Ching Kai. I don't. I don't know. No, I, I don't. I don't know why this is happening. But it's not as bad as it looks in that plot because we only plotted a thousand of the events. Um, but that's part of what we're doing now is understanding why it works the way it works. Um, so this is a, a real challenge. And and do you need to go back and recompute the full model no. if you change station distributions? No, no. That's the the benefit of adding and removing stations. Is it it's robust to the pattern of crustal deformation being sampled by different stations. So that's a good thing. Um, the, I think the large event, I think we just don't have enough events in training for the, for, I think 50,000 is not enough, okay. um, but, but, but we don't know for sure yet. So I open it to other questions from the, pardon? Only one more question uh, from the floor. Yes. Hi, Jeff. Sure. So this, let's suppose that, I mean, in the examples that were shown here, essentially each each seismogram coming from a different station was independent. That is, there's no correlated errors between them. And Diego, you treated the GPS as the same, although technically there are correlated errors, although yeah. they're probably small compared to the signals that you're looking at. Yeah. What if, I mean, is that a deal breaker? If you've got spatial correlated uh, errors with a structure we think we know, or maybe we hope we know, um, uh, does that cause any fundamental issues uh, with these sorts of approaches, or is that something that's fairly easy to handle? And I guess maybe the same thing would be true of temporally correlated errors in the data. Um, it, it does violate kind of basic assumptions that are that are going into all this, which is, which is it is assuming that you're not highly correlated like that. Um, it's not so much of a problem if you tend to or, or intend to use the model in the same area that you're applying it to. And which is then okay because if you're if you're overfitting on these examples, it doesn't matter because it's still in the same locations generally. Um, it does affect generalization outside of um, those locations. 
Uh, I think this is going to become a more important problem uh, going forward uh, and how we deal with this. It's not a trivial thing to deal with spatial correlation, how you parse up the data set, what you restrict it to and that kind of thing in order to try to um, decorrelate that in some sense. Um, and there are people working on this subject in, within computer science uh, and that kind of thing, but it's not just a simple answer. Um, yeah.